All right. Thanks. Thanks for uh, attending the mock paper review. I hope you guys all like um enjoy trying that paper. Um, for MCQ, I copied from like some school, and uh, for uh the paper four, I kind of created it myself. Um. Okay. So if you guys don't know yet, I know some people they you all are like very uh you all follow Overmark for quite some time. You guys know who we are, but some people maybe you all are new. Um, Overmark is a team of tutor who are who also used to be students. Uh, and just very recently, um, so uh, we are hope to provide a student centric platform that can help you guys in your uh, studies. So there's O level team and there's A level team. Um, okay, so a bit about myself. I my name is Sing Wei. Um, please just call me Sing Wei. I know some people call me I like to call me teacher, but it's okay. Um, you don't need to like you can just call me by my name. I was uh, in TKGS for my O level. Then I went on to RI for my A level. Um, then I took life science and psychology in NUS for my undergrad. So I have been teaching for six years since I finished my A level. Um, and I specialize in bio um, since then. Yeah, I teach both private and group tuitions. Okay, so uh, today we want to review the paper, right? So let's just go straight to it. Uh, we will um, we'll look through the paper one and paper four, so, uh, and then also just some uh, wrapping up about how to, um, what are the goals moving towards O level, and then um, and I will hope hopefully we have some time for Q and A, but I doubt so because we only have one hour for combined uh, bio. What is this one? No, it's not this one. This one. This one. Okay. Uh, let's look at MCQ first. Uh, I don't know. How do you guys find the paper? I think the paper in general, this paper, um, the set of it is not super challenging. It's not meant to be super challenging, but it does have certain details, um, uh, details that may not be super straightforward. I think this question is okay. Uh, Question okay for this question, then question 24. Um, a student is tasked, a student is tasked to uh, determine if a food sample contains carbohydrate. Carbohydrate, uh, what are the carbohydrates that you know? There is uh, monosaccharide, disaccharide, and polysaccharide. So these are the three types of carbohydrate you would know, right? And for um, because there are so many kinds of carbohydrate, uh, your first reaction may be Benedict test because it looks out for your uh, reducing sugar, which is all your monosaccharides and disaccharides except for sucrose. But at the same time, starch is also a carbohydrate. Starch is a polysaccharide. It is made up of many glucose. So, it is also... Uh, iodine test is also one of the tests that you should consider. So the 24, uh, question 24, the answer is C. This should be fine. This should be fine. Question 27. Question 27 um, is about the average number of chloroplasts. So these are the three types of cells that have chloroplasts. Um, in this question, actually, I think question, uh, the part two probably quite obvious the cell two, because it has the highest average number of chloroplasts, and that is our palisade mesophyll cells, right? The palisade mesophyll cells is the first layer, it gets the maximum amount of sunlight. Uh, for, question, for cell type one and three, um, cell one would be our gut cells, and cell three would be our spongy mesophyll cells, because gut cells in general are smaller, it also has less number of chloroplasts. Uh, all gut cells need, which paper four will talk about it, is that gut cells need some chloroplast just to carry out photosynthesis so it could have energy to pump in the potassium ions. Um, and this question, this question is actually um, for, those, for those of you who have bought the curated notes, this is actually what I put in the curated notes because I thought that this is always a little bit um, tricky, not challenging, but tricky. Um, firstly, identifying um, the Q, identifying the tissue that is point, uh, 
pointing to a structure Q and the inside is the xylem. And of course, xylem transporting um, water and mineral salt, it wouldn't show any result for binodic reagent and iodic solu uh, iodine solution. How about if it's pointing to this part? What would be the result? Um, so that was what I um, what I put in the curator notes. It is if it's pointing to the film, what does the film transport? So you need to know for uh you need to know like what does film transport? It transports sucrose and amino acid. So if it transports sucrose and amino acid, what would the uh what would um the result of the food test be? It would be also a negative result in general because sucrose is not a reducing sugar. So Benedict reagent, it wouldn't show a positive result. And amino acid makes up protein, but it isn't protein. So burette test, also negative. Okay, so just something to be very clear, what is it? Even though they are very similar, amino acid and protein, but when it comes to the food test, uh, very, need to be very clear what would show the positive result and what would show the negative result. Mm, this question should be fine. Also should be fine. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, I am just going to take it as people usually have some issue with inheritance, so I'm going to uh, talk about 39 and 40. So in question 39, it said that um, okay, the, the characteristic here is this ability to sell flowers, smell flowers, and it said that the allure is dominant. Okay, uh, important. Whether or not it's dominant and recessive, it would affect our answer. And it asks which individual symbol is not correct, which means that in this question, um, when it said the shaded one is able to smell, right? Uh, and then the white color one is not able to smell. But one of these is definitely wrong. So how do we know out of ABCD which one would be wrong? So we start writing it down. So when it said that it's able to smell uh, fridges, it has to be, uh, because it's dominant, it can either be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. And if, if it is not able to smell, which means that it's showing you like the white circle or white square, it has to be um, homozygous recessive, right? Because it is a dominant allele. So everything else is your homozygous recessive. So look at this and think, and think like, hmm, it's, uh, whether or not which one would be the wrong, uh, which one would probably be a wrong symbol. So let's see from here. See from, we start from the uh, first row. Okay, this uh, A. A and the A is the male, and then the uh, wife, they are both able to smell, which means that they both have a, they will both have the dominant allele. So it makes sense that, okay, their kid may have a dominant allele, which shows uh, here. Okay, that's okay. And then for B, uh, the pa both parents do not have that dominant allele. So it is also makes sense that it has, two uh, recessive allele, which is the small a, small a. And then for C and D, for C and D, um, the parents also do not have any dominant allele because it's not able to smell. So D cannot have that dominant allele. So which means that in this question, the symbol for D is wrong. Yeah, so it's kind of just like inferring um, and just writing it down and then see if anywhere inconsistent. For question 40, um, the allele for brown fur is dominant to, to the gray fur. And what would be the phenotype of a cross between a mouse heterozygous and then a mouse with gray fur? So brown fur is the dominant one. Gray fur is the recessive one. 
So it is a cross between a mouse heterozygous and a mouse with gray fur. Yeah, so you just cross this, which is uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Lah. Okay, moving on. Okay, so that's for MCQ. So we will go to paper four. Um, I will I will skip those questions that are um I think like you know it's something that you could just find on the notes. Uh, and then probably also share a little bit more on answering technique because that is what a lot of people like I have been teaching for quite some time. A lot of people usually struggle with like answering and then making sure like you have the uh key points. Okay. Um, by the way, for those who join a bit later, I have already uploaded the answer on the Telegram uh, channel. So you can download that and then refer and then mark yourself, like make sure you get the points. One thing that I want to share is that um, there is no like 100% you have to follow this answer. Uh, if I am not word for word, then I'm getting it wrong. Of course, it's not like that, right? So what I am providing, what I just uploaded is a model answer. It is... Uh, the suggested answer, how I would answer. And of course, some keywords, they are necessary. Um, so, but then it may not be phrased like that. So it's up to your discretion to make sure uh, what you mean and what I'm trying to say, and then the keywords are there. Okay, so for question one, um, it starts with some labeling, which is, uh, we shouldn't be too big, uh, too big an issue should be able to identify this bin-shaped thing, are the gut cells. And then, um, so Q is gut cell. Uh, P is, what is beside the gut cell will be the epidermal cell. Uh, or you could say the lower epidermal cell. So what I want to highlight here is R. R, we all know, is the stomata. But usually we call it stomata, right? Like when we were like referring to other explanation and what. But when it comes to labeling, one thing you need to note, one thing you need to be uh, careful of is the singular and plural uh, structure. So for stomata, the singular is stoma. It's the same concept as when we are labeling cells. And I, I think you must have encountered this like in your school before. Is that when let's say when you label mitochondria, you can't label it mitochondria because it's only one it is mitochondrion. Okay, so same idea for this. Um, when it comes to labeling, just make sure you are aware of this um, singular and plural tense. And for this question, this part B question, it is describe and explain how structure Q, which is the gut cells, help structure R, which is the stoma, to remain open and closed. So uh, this is also something that is um, pretty straightforward it is in your it is in the notes it's in um, I mean, like your textbook the curator notes is also just there um, how probably the problem here is that it is quite long like both the um, open and closed part it is both uh, pretty long because you have to talk about how um, it pumps potassium ion in and then it uh, lower the water potential water move in and things like that so how you would um, deal with this question, you of course you don't have to write out everything. Um, if you can, of course that will be great because that means that you cover both sides, both the during the day and at night, the two scenarios. But in general, because it is four mark, so as long as you could cover one scenario very well, which is which I would recommend just covering the day the day part, and then um, briefly talk about how um, at night. Potassium ion will move out, so the uh, water would also move out, and then gut cells become flaccid, so it keep uh, it close up. Yeah. So here, uh, if you see the model answer that I posted, there's a few points. So um, make sure that you at least cover one scenario fully. Yeah. Okay. Um. This question, it shows a, a section of human elementary canal and then accessory organs. So being able to label X, uh, for the labeling part, it is uh, 
really just have to make sure you look at the pictures uh, and then make sure you uh, know which card is where. Lah. And so X is gallbladder. And the function, uh, what you're looking for is that it stalls bowel, but it doesn't produce bowel. Okay, so uh, the as long as you say that it stalls bowel is good enough, um, my answer is I say that bowel that is produced by liver, that is extra, as long as you can say that gallbladder store the bowel. Okay, uh, this question B, it asks for bowel and pancreatic duct is blocked. So it find it difficult to gain weight. Okay, so here, when the bowel and pancreatic duct is blocked, it find it difficult to gain weight. So the, uh, what it affects here is that, of course, you have to talk about what exactly is the function of bowel duct and pancreatic duct. You want to cover both because it asks for both. And when there is this kind of two-part question, it, they, sorry, they allocate mark to both sides. So maximum two mark for bowel and maximum two mark for pancreatic duct. So um, when the duct is blocked, what is in the bowel, yes, it will be posted on YouTube. Uh, what is in the bowel cannot um, be released and what is in the pancreas cannot be released. So what is in those? Uh, for bowel, there's only one thing. Sorry, for uh, gallbladder, there's only one thing, which is bowel. And then for the pancreas, there's a few, right? The pancreatic um, enzyme, there is um, trypsin, amylase, and lipase. So you could also only choose one to talk about them. Um, don't have to talk about all. Another tip for your exam is that when they give you like five lines here um, and you're writing eight, nine lines, that's too much. And if they give you five lines, you're writing like six, seven, like maybe, you know, the, the, space, the space here, still okay. Lah. Then you can still, means that you're not overwriting too much. So in this case, um, I'm sure like your teacher also mentioned how O level doesn't give half a mark, is one point, one mark, things like that. So it's, it's the same. There's a lot of things to write for this. You can talk about um, amylase, lipase, trypsin and everything, but you can just pick one and then uh, explain that well. So here, um, bowel not being able to release, it can emulsify fats and then the, your surface area to volume ratio for lipase to act on and the enzymes cannot be secreted. So the key here is reduce digestion and also so um, reduce digestion and absorption. These are the two, both concepts that you have to hit on uh, where we talk about this question. Okay. Um, I realized that I should just share. I should just share my... Okay. Uh, for, for C, um, when you talk about... Okay, so C, this kind of question is like the kind of like a little bit more interesting question like, or what we will call it like the application question, right? It is not straight from the textbook, straight from the notes. Uh, you need to think a little bit and then answer to the question. So it asks for why is medicine containing protein coated in lipid? So you know sometimes when you go to doctor, you get your medicine. Um, your medicine sometimes are in capsule. And this question is asking why is medicine containing protein coated in lipid? So I don't know if you guys had any idea like... Uh, not sure whether you're able to answer this question. But the idea of this is, okay, so let, let's, let's go through right, the whole flow. When you see this question, you're like, oh my God, I don't know. I, I don't know why medicine need to code in lipid. Because that's the first reaction. We never learned that. Then we think of what chapter is this testing for? Because I always tell my students, they cannot test you something that you don't know. At least... Um, they can't just test you anything that's like out of the out of the way, right? It has to be something that you know or like related. When you look at this question, oh, but this question tell you like using your knowledge about the elementary canal. So they tell you that it's a digestion chapter. But in let's say they don't tell you that, you also uh have to start thinking what chapter possibly could this be. So um 
so once we identify that, then we will start thinking about, okay, so what did I learn in the digestion chapter? Um, what did I learn that could, that is related to protein, related to lipid? So in this case, if the um, protein and lipid, so protease and lipase, right? So um, in order to break down the capsule, you will need lipase. And then the medicine containing protein is something that you would want to absorb because that's, that's the medicine. And where is lipase and protease found? So that is the important question. So in this case, the stomach contains protease, but it doesn't contain lipase. So, um, and where is lipase found? Lipase is also not found in the mouth. It's not found in the stomach. It's only found in the small intestine. So in this case, um, when the medicine containing protein is coated in the lipid, it makes sure that this medicine can safely reach the small intestine before the lipase secreted by the small intestine um, digest the lipid coating of the medicine and then release the protein to, to be absorbed in small intestine. So because small intestine carry out both digestion and absorption, but mouth and stomach only have digestion. Okay, so uh, the answer is there. So I won't um, go into like how you should answer, but that is, the, that is the idea here, which is using your enzyme knowledge uh, the location of the enzyme that's being secreted to answer this question. Um, this question should be fine, right? So just take the two functions of liver. For combined science, you need to know, you should know at least five. So just as a test, you can like start thinking of um, how, um, like, what are the five things that you need to know about uh, this function of liver? Can we talk about how acid will corrode the medicine? Um, it's not really about that. It's more like the protein in the medicine will be digested by the pepsin. Then uh, the medicine is of no effect. Then, yeah. So imagine like it's a protein that is supposed to like exert certain effect for your, medicine, uh, for your condition. But then if it's being digested, like broken down in the stomach, then it won't actually exert the effect the medicine should do. Yeah. So it's more like about digestion. Okay, this question. Uh, for this question, um, it is it shows the pressure of left ventricle, uh, left atrium and left ventricle. And the question, the first question asks for with reference to the table. What, uh, when is the valve between the atrium and ventricle closed? Basically, this valve is the bicuspid valve, right? So, because it says it's the left side. So, bicuspid valve, uh, when is it closed? So, in these two marks, first mark is that you have to talk about when, and then second mark is explain. So, when is it closed? And this is, a, this is special, right? Usually, I think when you guys... Uh, when we look at this, it's usually in the graph format. Um, but this is like a simpler version because it's not in the graph format. It just tells you what is the blood pressure in the ventricle and atrium. So here, uh, I'm going to share these tips that I always tell uh, my students. Like, you know, for, if you all attended my crash course, you all would have um, heard about this, which is that when do the, um, the function of valve is to prevent backflow of blood. So a valve will open when we want the blood to flow that direction and the valve will close when we don't want the blood to flow the direction. And what determines the blood flow? It is the pressure. So imagine, this is the heart, right? Atrium and ventricle. And the valve is between here. Okay? So let's say when the pressure in the atrium is higher than the ventricle, naturally the blood will flow from the atrium to the ventricle, right? Um, normal, uh, like it's like your high to low kind of uh, concept. But let's say when the ventricle pressure is higher than the atrium pressure, the blood will want to flow from the ventricle to the atrium. So it is also natural because it's just how pressure works, high to low. 
But is that what we want? So that is something that you need to ask yourself. So uh, blood flows from ventricle to atrium, is that what we want? No. Uh, so go and familiarize yourself with the path of blood, right? Starting from vena cava to the right atrium, right ventricle, all these things. So after establishing that, okay, ventricle to atrium is not what we want, then we have to close the atrial ventricular valve or bicuspid valve or tricuspid valve, depending on which side it is. So in this case, when will it be closed? It's when the ventricular pressure is higher than the uh, atrium pressure. So which will be 0 0.1. To 0 0.5. Yeah. So 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 is the time where the valve between the atrium and ventricle is closed. And your explanation is exactly what I just said, which is that the pressure in the left ventricle is higher than the pressure in right ventricle. So the atrial ventricular valve will close to prevent the backflow of the blood. Okay? Yes. Yeah. So uh, about the closing of valve, think of what I just said, I think that will be very helpful instead of just memorizing the graph uh, at which point, yeah. So think of the pressure of the blood and think of the pathway of the blood. Okay, uh, for part B, the pressure in ventricle, okay, the part B uh, is also something that I want to just talk about. Uh, the answer is there, but I just want to talk about how I don't recommend talking about, uh, if your answer is that, uh, pressure in ventricle is higher because it needs to transport blood to the aorta, to the rest of the body. I don't recommend talking about that because it is a consequence rather than a cause. Because when we are suggesting why is it that the pressure is higher, it's about the, the force generated at first. So in this case, it should be that because the wall in ventricle is thicker than the wall in atrium. Okay, blood vessel, this one is okay. Okay, uh, for part one, the D part one is something that I want to talk about because um, it is kind of like a, a combination, right? No topic is in isolation. It's not like, oh, I can only study this topic. I don't need to study the other topic. Everything is linked. No single bio chapter is not linked to other chapter. So in this case, when we talk about describe the route of oxygen from the ageo line being transported to the coronary artery, uh, so some of my students look at this chapter, they're like, what? How would I know the path? But think clearly, think like more in depth, right? Um, the alveoli is in the lung, right? Alveoli is in the lung. Mm. Lung. So what is the direction from the lung? Uh, sorry, not, not the direction. Uh, what is the role of lung in this whole transport system, in the transport in human part? It is linking to our pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein. So the oxygen in the alveoli, it comes into the blood capillaries. Then the blood get oxygenated. Where will it go? It will go back to the heart, left side. Atrium, ventricle. Then it's said to the coronary artery. Coronary artery is like, considered like other part of the body. So it has to branch off from aorta. So it goes to the aorta and then coronary artery. So the path is basically alveoli, blood capillaries in lung, pulmonary vein, left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, coronary artery. Yeah, so this kind of question will apply to many, many scenarios. Um, they can ask you about um, glucose from small intestine to coronary artery. But the pathway is always the same. It's always about moving back to the heart, moving to the lung, and then becoming oxygenated and then coming back to the lung and then being transported elsewhere. Okay, so this is something to think of as well. The pathway uh, is about linking many chapters together. Oh, this is, I think this is usually okay. This is also about pupil reflex. And um, for part, uh, for the part two, it's really just um, combining your knowledge about reflex action and then applying the reflex action to like your eye structure. So your radial muscle, circular muscle, right? So in this question, what I want to highlight is just like, remember these receptors, 
sensory neuron, relay neuron, motor neuron, and then effector. This is, it's just this sequence. This sequence in um, everything that you, everything reflects action. But of course, in this case, because it has to do with the eyes, you have to put in the eyes knowledge, especially in the effector part, right? So what are the effector in pupil reflex? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so for part B, uh, this question part B, it is also the same thing because it is just about applying what you know about reading something up close. So it's about uh, ciliary body contract, suspensory ligament relax, and then relax the pool on the lens, things like that. But in this case, why is it that? The special thing is that, why is it not recommended that you keep reading something up close? So you must also feel it yourself, right? When you read something too close, right? Or like you've, you're studying for too long, right? Your eyes will get very tired. Why? Which part of the eyes will get tired? It is the ciliary muscle being strained out because it's always contracting. So therefore, you will be very tight. Yeah, so the other parts um, should be fine because it's all in the notes. Um, same thing, the cause of Down syndrome, sickle cell, all these are in the notes as well. Okay, this part. For this part, um, the two ways how a DNA molecule is different from polypeptide. This kind of question is totally not something that are in your notes. They don't tell you, they don't tell you that. Um, in your notes, but it's something that you can just, when it comes to um, this kind of different, like different compare, uh, compare and contrast, all this kind of question, you have, to, you have to compare point to point, right? So just start thinking of what is your DNA molecule like and what is your, uh, uh, what is your protein like and polypeptide like. Um, Usually when you come to this kind of comparison, you have to compare point to point, which means that uh, you cannot just give like a whole chunk about your structure of DNA. Because I know you guys know that very well because it's in your notes, right? The whole chunk of structure of DNA and then the whole chunk about polypeptide. No, you have to find um, the comparing point. So in this case, what is the basic unit of a polypeptide? Amino acid. What is the basic unit of um, DNA molecule? It is nucleotide. So in this case, the first point is like the basic unit. And then, um, so how I would recommend you to think is that, so as I said, you know the structure of DNA very well, right? It's in the notes, right? Super complete. The first point is like a basic unit is nucleotide and then nucleotide is made up of this, 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 uh, phosphate, sugar, nitrogenous base, or this thing. And then, so you talk about nucleotide versus the equivalent of protein is the amino acid. And then for the structure of DNA, you also talk about how um, it's double helix. It is um, two strand twist together, right? This is how you would describe DNA. So what is that kind um, equivalent of protein? It is that protein has a 3D conformation, right? It will fold to form a 3D conformation. Um, so it is the double helix versus 3D conformation. And we can also talk about um, when we talk about DNA, you talk, also talk about complementary base pairing between the nitrogenous bases, and there isn't such hydrogen, uh, hydrogen bonding in the protein. Or you can say that the bond that's present in the protein is peptide bond, things like that. Okay, yeah. So this kind of question is more like, um, I put it here, not because like this is very important to know like the comparison or anything, more like uh, when you ever come across a question that requires you to compare two things, you could always just, um, don't, don't panic, right? It's, even though it's not something that you usually see, but don't panic first. Um, think of how you would at least describe DNA molecule or how you would describe polypeptide. Then you just try to think of the comparing point. And, and point to point, like what I did, just did. Uh, this question is a very common question, but it's in the notes, so I'll skip. Okay, this question. Um, so for your section B, answer any two questions, right? Just now, everything you have to answer. But section B, you can answer any two questions. 
I'm going to make a PSA here, public service announcement. Do not spend too long trying to choose your question. Uh, once you, I think it's quite clear usually when you read, when you look, when you look at a question six, seven, eight, you choose any two. Um, usually if you see, you read, of course read through every question, right? This kind, read through A, read through B, uh, read through C. Then look at all the questions. And usually I think if you have a clear answer, then that's very obvious. You don't want this topic, so you don't do this question. I think the problem comes when like everything is about the same. And a lot of people spend time, spend too long thinking of which, which question to do. Um, how I would advise is that when you, when really that case, if, it's, if it is every question also you, you are confident with getting 10 marks, then that's great. Just pick any two, don't spend too long thinking. But every question you're not very sure, uh, then you have to spend a bit more time to look at point by point. Um, also not too long, but in general, look through A, B, C and say like, oh, okay, A, I think I can get this three mark. Uh, I think I can get this three mark. Um, um, B, I'm not very sure, but I can try. And C, um, I can try. So I know like I can get about five, six, seven mark in this question eight. Then when you look at seven, uh, question seven, then you're like, oh, okay, I can do both. So I should be able to get 10. And then this question, you are like, I can do this, maybe I can get half of this, and then I know this. So it's about seven mark here. So in this case, you choose to do question seven and your question six, right? Because um, it just looks a little bit more confident for question six versus question eight, that kind of that kind of thing. Okay, so in this case, it is of course, identifying what is the uptake of water. And then he asked about how air bubble will move. So every time you talk about air bubble, there's this case, this kind of thing. Hopefully you identify, you manage to identify a topic. It's the transpiration topic. And B is a very long question. Um, B requires you to describe the detailed process. It's also a two-part question. I think I just like setting two parts question. Maybe O-level won't have so many. Just want to put it out there. It asks you to describe the detailed process. And then um, it also asks you to highlight the importance of this process. Uh, so in this case, of course, the importance of the process is not going to take, like, you, you won't talk about it like for like four or five months, right? The importance at most one or two. Um, but um, the most importantly is the process here. Um, and it's the transpiration process, basically, how water moves how the water entered the cut stem, how water eventually entered the leaf, and then how water actually leave the leaf. Um, of course, not, not only in the form of water, uh, it, it varies, it becomes water vapor as well. So um, the, the answer is there, so I won't go into the details. Mm. But this kind of question, this kind of long, long question is where I will put it out there that memorization is essential. So I always say that memorization is, uh, bio is not only about memorization, but bio is, uh, memorization, memorization is essential in bio. So this, this kind of long question is just, you just have to remember. And you have to not just remember, you have to know what the keywords are and how to use them. Sometimes people know the keywords, but they write it in a non-scientific manner. Then that is not good enough to get you marked, yeah. Okay, so when you say that this cut stem is placed in the soil, it started developing roots, suggest how these plants reproduce. So how it reproduce, this is one, and then the two advantages of this method. So when you say that the cut stem just placed in the root, then it starts developing uh, roots, then it has to be asexual reproduction, right? There's no pollination or anything. So it's asexual reproduction and it's advantageous. It's also in the notes. Okay, this kind of question, very straightforward, five mark, five mark. Same thing. Section B is just, it just has like a longer question, right? In section A, you have your one mark, two mark, one mark, two mark. And then when you come to section B, it will be your like uh, four, five, six mark. So describe the level of hormone, estrogen and progesterone, and the effect on menstrual cycle. So this is about just describing like your whole uh, our, like the whole menstrual cycle um, and knowing the 
up and down. La. So, right, it increased and decreased at a different day, right? So, you have to talk about the day, you have to talk about the level, and then the events. Yeah. So, this is also actually pretty straightforward, right? Just, it's in the notes. Kind of just copy down the menstrual cycle and then omitting certain not important points, but then focus on the hormone level. Um, and other than that, so other than your day one to five, the both level of estrogen and progesterone are low, so uterine lining breakdown and things like that. Uh, and then level, level of estrogen will increase and then decrease, then progesterone will increase after day 14, things like that. Um, there is also about the fertilization and non-fertilization part. So fertilization happens, right? If fertilization happens, progesterone go up or down. So if fertilization occurs, the progesterone will continue being secreted. So the level will remain high. It's important to keep the uterine lining thick, right? So that um, eventually the embryo can be implanted so that the fetus will grow. But if there is no fertilization, then the cycle repeats. Yeah, so these are like your extra points that is just out of your usual uh, menstrual cycle content. And then question B, it asks you to describe the importance of hormones to human. It's a very, very vague. Um, it's a very vague question. Big question got one advantage and one pro and con. The pro is that you can write about a lot of things. The con is that what to write. So think of all the hormones that you know. Uh, actually, you know quite a lot. Uh, name, example, um, glucagon, insulin. I realized that you do not know adrenaline and diuretic hormone, which I put it there. This is so, what you can write is just glucagon and insulin because it's what you learn in the hormone chapter, right? Like, and the importance is that it uh, regulate the blood glucose concentration. Do we describe and explain? Yes. So when you talk about describe the level of hormone and its effect, the effect part is basically the explaining part, right? So when you describe, uh, it goes up and down at a certain day. Like for example, estrogen will fall to very low at day 14, but progesterone will start growing up. Uh, you also explain its effect, which is that uh, uterine lining will at first, it's repair and then it further thicken. Yeah. So this is kind of explaining when you talk about describing the effect of the hormones on menstrual cycle. Okay. So back to B. Um, the importance of hormone. When you talk about importance, name example. So of course you have to name out glucagon and insulin, or uh, either one is fine, and then talk about its important, which is regulating blood glucose concentration, and then the function of the but, uh, function of the hormone. So what is the function of insulin? What's the function of glucagon? So um, here the points are also you know just there that it um, will stimulate the body cells to increase glucose uptake by increasing the permeability of plasma membrane and then it will stimulate the liver and muscle cells to convert excess glucose to glycogen. Right? So this is the function of insulin. So here, um, it is to regulate blood glucose level. Right. This is the function of it. How it regulates. And then also, what is, how, why is it that it's important to have a constant uh, blood glucose level? So we, we, we know that we have to maintain it, right? When it increases, then we need to bring it down. When it decreases, we need to bring it up. But why is it so? Um, so this question is also asking for that. So why is blood glucose level important to stay constant? It's because we do not want it to affect the water potential of our blood, right? So this is also in the notes. So just make sure you put it out there. Uh, or you can talk about just in general, a very homeostasis perspective, which is that when the changes is detected, uh, it serves as a message to the effector so that we can respond to the stimulus. It's a very, yeah, it's a how, why, why is hormone there, that kind of thing. And the key thing is that please do not answer about progesterone or estrogen because you already talked about it in A. Yeah, so even though it's also important, but uh, don't answer that. Okay, uh, for question eight, the blood clotting process is also in the notes. I'm not going to talk about it. 
now we let's talk about this genetic diagram because I think genetic diagram, um, this question is a little bit more, uh, a little bit different from usual genetic diagram because it is asking in a way, they ask for how the genotype of a warfarin resistant rat can be determined, right? It's not your usual, not really your usual genetic diagram question. So let's read the question. Resistant to poison warfarin is now extremely common in rats. So basically, warfarin is like a po rat's poison. Um, but certain rats are resistant to that. So warfarin resistant uh, rats is um, determined by a dominant allele. So same thing. What is the possible genotype? It is um, homozygous dominant and heterozygous. So both of these would... Um, lead to this rat being resistant to warfarin. And this question is asking, how can we de determine between this and this, which one is a rat? Um, so let's say we have one rat, and is this rat the um, homozygous dominant, or is it a heterozygous? heterozygous? So in this case, uh, what you would do is that you will cross it with a, a warfarin-sensitive rat. So when you cross it with a Yeah. So, um, so that just so that you know that the one with prosthesis is a smaller one. So let's say it is if the rat is a heterozygous and you cross it with a um homozygous recessive one, the ratio that you will get is one is to one, right? Of course, you have to draw out the whole genetic diagram. Uh, but because the answer is there, the whole genetic diagram is there, I won't go into the details. I just want to remind you all to circle your gummies. That's all. Okay, so the ratio, if you cross like that, it will be 1 is to 1. Okay. Um, if the red is homozygous dominant, and you cross it with a sensitive one, what you will get is that all of them will be resistant. So there is 100% uh, of resistant rats versus if you uh, cross it with uh, versus 50 50. So one scenario will be that it will be 50 50, and one scenario will be that 100% of them would be um, resistant to warfarin. So this is how you can decide, determine the genotype of a warfarin-resistant rat. So in this case, you only need to draw one of the diagram. So any of the that yeah, you choose. Uh, you can either draw this scenario or draw this scenario. But in the few lines bottom that we are providing, then of course you have to explain how does that help, right? So the first part is that warfarin-resistant rat could either be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Then you explain your result. When crossed with a warfarin sensitive red, which is your uh, this two small w, it would um, if it is if it's crossed with like the scenario one, right? If it is a home heterozygous, then you will get uh, 50 percent, 50 percent, or one is to one. But when you cross it with a um, homozygous dominant, homozygous dominant, then you would get all resistance. Yeah, so this is the two scenario. You choose one to draw, but you have to explain how you are using, how exactly you are determining the genotype of a warfarin resistant rat. Yeah, so this is a more uh, special question when it comes to genetic diagram. Okay, question C. I think a lot of people miss out, at least from my experience, uh, is that there's this learning outcome is about how um, you should be able to explain why is your observed ratio usually different from your expected ratio. So uh, why is this so? It's because that, so here the keyword is that your observed ratio, observed ratio 
versus your expected ratio. So what I just mentioned, right, all these 50, 50, and 100% is the expected ratio, which means that you expect that theoretically when you draw a genetic diagram, that is the, that's a chance. But in actual fact, that's not true, right? Like, for example, we all know that the expected ratio for a um, male, like, son to daughter is like 50-50, but there is a whole family can be like full of daughter, a whole family full of son. That's because this, um, there is a small number of offspring. Small number of offspring. So the idea here is that the observed ratio will differ from the expected ratio if there is a small number of offspring, if the sample size is small. Okay, so this is a very important concept. And the explanation is that because fertilization, the fusion of like your male gamete and female gamete or the egg and the sperm is a total random and chance event. So it could be that all of it just produce a certain kind or it do shows the... Uh, probability. So it depends. And in this case, because they asked for only six offspring, which is a very small number, right? It's a very small sample size. So the observed ratio and the expected ratio will differ quite a bit. And because fertilization of ova and sperm is a random and chance event. Okay. Something to take note of. Okay. We have seven minutes. Um, so let's need quickly to go back to Note. Uh, start sending in question if you have any question. Um, I will I will try to answer you guys. So send in all the question. Mm. But moving moving. Uh, so while I while you guys send question, if any, um, I think like bio. We know that bio has a lot of content, right? That's what a lot of people say. Bio has a lot of things to memorize. Bio has a lot of content. Don't know how to answer them and things like that. So uh. But very, very first thing is like, you know, it's been, we started on this journey. You guys started on this journey since sec three last year, January. Uh, by now, it is important to have a very good understanding of your content. So getting your content right. Um, if the step one is not there, like the understanding of your content, then the part, the step two and three that is listed here, the practice makes perfect and testing yourself, it, wouldn't work. It wouldn't um, actually help. So without a, a full, good understanding of your content, uh, and then you go and do practice paper, you go and do TYS, it doesn't, it doesn't help because um, you don't exactly know what you're answering, you don't have the keywords there, um, and things like that. Okay, so full understanding of the content, make sure you get it right. There's still time. I just want to stress that there's still time. Um, and as I mentioned just now, memorization is essential. Mm, it is it's just important but you don't just memorize you understand then you memorize the keywords of course practice makes perfect so uh, once you get the step one done then start doing a lot of practice paper uh, prelim paper TYS there's a lot of resources out there uh, and it's not like one single line right like once you okay I understand the content already I no longer have to look at the content I just keep doing the practice paper that's not true it's a cycle. When you're doing practice paper, you have to like, wait, did I mem uh, memorize this wrongly? Uh, did I understand this wrongly? So when you check your answer and things like that. So it's a process. You keep going back. When you do practice paper, then you go back and like check your understanding, check your facts, and make sure like you have all the keywords listed out. Um, so yeah, I wanted to use this uh, effect. But so we know that ecology is being removed from our um, syllabus this year, which is a great news, right? Because um, it is very content heavy, um, less thing to memorize for you guys, but it also means something. So in the past five years, ecology has always been like the largest, um, like largest percentage of the paper. Like it will appear like twice, two questions. So re by removing that, right? By removing like this, such an important topic, like such a heavy topic, it just means that you will add the if uh, it will add all the other per a percentage to every other topic. So 
uh, it, it, it becomes that every other chapter will get a lot more weightage as well. So last time it used to be like, like you can see there are this, the, the nervous system eyes, they are all like 3%-ish, um, biological molecule 3%-ish, very little. Um, but um, so now with removing ecology, uh, it really do mean that every other topic will get a little bit more weightage. So uh, you, have, you do have to transfer your time to study, make sure you know other topics even better. Um, so someone say like, could you send us more people? Um, I don't have a lot of people. So uh, I'm pretty sure like your school probably have way more people than me. And what I have is also just searching online. So if your school don't give you enough paper and you finish everything already, maybe try to search online and redo some paper, like or redo like past paper that you did before. Uh, okay, so um, some of you have known, like uh, we also provide crash course um, and actually soft plug for the combined chem and bio. I don't know if Daryl is here, but um, we are having our online crash course this Saturday. So if you want to just have one more like very comprehensive and like revision before you start, uh, before you end your September holiday, you can still sign up. Uh, you'll get like a, I can't remember, 200 plus pages curated notes. Um, it is a very nicely like curated notes to answer a lot of um, exam questions. So do sign up. The link is in on the website as well if you are interested. Uh, yes, so the Saturday one is for combined chem bio. And of course, there are also other subjects. If you need to write uh, math and AMF, oh, he's here, um, and English, things like that. Yeah, they are all um, here. Yes, so there's no question. Okay, I guess everyone quite okay with this, this paper. I hope you guys did well when you mark the paper from the from my answer. So what will we be covering today? Uh, we'll do paper one first, which is your MCQ. Then we'll do your paper two. So at around the halfway mark, right? Around 8.35, 8.40, I'll give you a short break. And then uh, we'll finish up the paper two review uh, before moving on to a quick Q&A. Then we'll have a short break uh, for the physics students. You can take a five minute break. Then from nine to 10, we're going to focus on the physics paper. All right. So without further ado, let's jump straight into the paper. If you are not aware, um, the answer sheet has already been uploaded in the Telegram channel. Uh, so I highly encourage you to go and take it out. And then as I'm going through, right, if you have already printed out and attempted your paper, I think what would be great is for you to jot down notes, right, that I say, and then you go and include these notes inside your, on the paper itself. Then for students that are, um, you know, you only have the soft copy, I think that's fine as well. Uh, if you have an iPad or something, you might want to write it down or write it down separately on full scale paper. All right. Now, um, so let's take a look at the first 20 MCQ questions. I'll highlight what are the key learning points and things I would need you to be aware of uh, whenever you're attempting this practice. Okay. Now, question one, this is about experimental design. So we have two guesses here. Guess X, guess Y. Now, the first thing you want to recognize is that guess X is insoluble in water, while guess Y is soluble in water. How is this important and what does this actually do? Okay, so for gas X, if it's insoluble in water, what this means is that you can actually use displacement of water as a gas collection method. If you're wondering what displacement of water is about, it's actually under this portion here called experimental design. So if I were to scroll down, okay, you will see that gas collection, there are three methods. You can either do displacement of water, upward delivery, or downward delivery. If you're wondering what this document is, it's just the curated notes, right? The soft copy version, all right? Um, so here, you need to note that for gases that are not very soluble in water, you can use this method, right? Because if it's soluble in water, it dissolves inside the water, you don't even collect any gas, right? So displacement of water is used purely for gases that are insoluble in water. Hence, we can narrow down our answer already. Gas X, we should be using displacement of water, all right? Now, both gases have... MR greater than 40. How is this information useful? Okay, you need to know that when we are comparing whether to use upward or downward delivery, it's a matter of comparing with the MR of air. 
Okay, what do I mean by that? Anybody can recall what is the composition of air? Okay, it's a rhetorical question because nobody's going to answer me. But it's going to be 78% nitrogen, okay? And 21% oxygen, okay? So if you go and add up, right, and you calculate, nitrogen MR is around 28. Oxygen MR is around 32. So if you cal calculate the average um, MR of air, you will see that it's actually somewhere around 29. There about, lah, not very precise. But MR of air is around 29. And if your guess is greater than 40, what this means is that your air, your guess here, your guess X and Y, it is heavier than air. So if it's heavier than air, it would sink, which is why the correct method here is using downward delivery. So upward and downward, you don't really have to memorize which gas is collected using which method. You don't have to say, okay, I need to memorize NH3 upward, right? Or Cl2HClSO2 is downward. You just need to compare the MR of these gases, okay, with the MR of air, which is approximately 29. That's when you know, okay, do I use upward or downward, okay? It depends on the MR in relation to air. So no need to memorize here, okay? Therefore, answer should be A, okay? Question two. Uh, which gas is neither an element nor a compound, okay? This one's also pretty straightforward because you need to know that air is a mixture of gases, right? So if it's a mixture, it's neither an element nor a compound, okay? So answer is B. Now, question three, we are given some melting and boiling point, okay? So the question wants you to analyze and make some deductions, okay? When we say volatile compound, what this is referring to is something that easily turns from liquid state to gaseous state. Okay, I give you an example of something easy to remember. Volatile compound, think of perfume, right? The moment you spray the perfume, the liquid turns into gas, okay? What causes something to be volatile? It is implied that it has a low boiling point, okay? So if the boiling point is low, is easily, for example, if the boiling point is at room temperature, it can easily turn from liquid to gas at room temperature. So if you take a look at W, is the boiling point very low? Yes, it's a low boiling point, which is why W is, we can conclude that it's a volatile compound, okay? Uh, does X exist as a gas at room temperature? Yes, because at negative 36, it already turned into a gas. Meanwhile, for Y, it is a solid because it has yet to reach the melting point. So it's still in solid state at room temperature, okay? Substance Z, we notice here that the melting boiling point is low. So our deduction here is that it should be a simple molecular structure. Okay, and we know that simple molecular structure like N2O2H2, okay, uh, it is likely to exist as a diatomic molecule. So this is true. Okay, so since all four statements are true, answer should be D. Okay, at any point, if you have questions, you can type it in the chat. Uh, I will not be able to answer directly if there's a lot of questions, uh, but if there's only one or two, I might clarify. Okay, but I mean, for the bulk of everybody's time, I'll try to go through the main paper and address your questions accordingly, okay? Now, for question four, I think the main thing you want to look out for is the term ion, all right? Did we even write out three plus here, right? So you would want to take note, okay, this one is just three plus, huh? When we are talking about subatomic particles in the nucleus, we are referring to mainly your protons and neutrons, okay? So if we take a look at boron, it has five proton and six neutron, so, 10 is wrong. It should have 11 subatomic particles in the nucleus, okay? Um, if you pay attention to the analysis and the breakdown, you take a look, there's six neutron and two electron. So is there, are there more neutrons than electrons? Yes, this is true, okay? Therefore, answer should be D, okay? What does subatomic mean? Subatomic means we have an atom, right? This is an atom. Inside the atom is what we call subatomic particles. In conclusion, there's only three subatomic particles that you're required to know, okay? And what are they? They are your protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, where do you find this? Under atomic structure, right? Subatomic particles, there's exactly three of them, okay? Only your proton and your neutron is within your nucleus. Electron lies on the electron shell, all right? Now, question five, this is a periodic table. Which statement is true? The reason why B is true is because we need to know that ionic compounds form between a metal and a non-metal. So A is a metal and C is a non-metal. So ionic compound, yes, okay? A is in group one while C is in group six. So when they bond, okay, 
they would form a compound A to C. Okay, that's why the answer here is B. All right. If not, as you take a look at question six, okay, here you'll notice this is purely about balancing your equation. Okay, so I won't go through, but the general technique that you need to learn here is that we always balance using the least common element first. Okay, so I think the easiest to balance here would actually be the N. Okay, in fact, it's quite easy to balance. There's nothing really very jarring about this. Then you might want to balance the X, the Z, then the H. Okay, by the end of the day, since it's an MCQ, you can always double check whether your answer is correct. Okay, even if you don't know how to do it, you just try all the options and you check through. Okay, so these kind of questions are free marks. Okay, you might need to spend a bit more time on it, but it's worth the mark for sure. Okay. So next, okay, um, for question seven, okay, for question seven here, we see sulfur acid being neutralized by uh, potassium hydroxide. As per all more concept questions, you need to know that the first step is definitely to write out your balanced chemical equation. Okay, so what's the balanced chemical equation here? Okay, H2SO4, which is sulfur acid, neutralizing with potassium hydroxide to form salt and water. Okay, is this equation balanced yet? It's not yet balanced. Why? It's because here there is H2 and then there's KOH. Okay, sorry, uh, please mute yourself so that it doesn't uh, disrupt the, 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 the mic here. Okay, so in order to balance the equation, this is how it should look. All right, so the mole ratio of sulfur acid to potassium hydroxide is one is to two. Okay, so first thing you want to do is to calculate the number of mole of potassium hydroxide. How do we do that? We'll take volume times concentration. Okay. Because here is in dm cube, so I have to change my cm cube to dm cube by dividing by 1000. Okay, so after calculation, you should get somewhere along the lines of 0 0.025 mole. Okay, this is for KOH. Okay, now if KOH is 0 0.025, how much mole of H2SO4 do I need? Okay, so when you compare the mole ratio between KOH and H2SO4, the mole ratio is 2 is to 1. So if this is 0 0.025, that means this one should be half of that, which is 0 0.0125 mole. Okay. Then all you need to do is to take the volume times concentration to check which one gives you 0 0.125. Okay. And the answer should be C. Okay. So this is how question 7 should be done. Okay. Balance equation, calculate mole, compare mole ratio, and then you find what is the answer. Okay. Question eight, we see rubidium here. You might not have seen it before, but rubidium, if you check your periodic table, is actually in group one, right? So which method is most likely to be used for its extraction? Here, we need to go to the chapter in metals. Okay, why do I say that? If you let me bring myself over to the notes, okay? What I need you all to recognize is that when we are talking about extraction of metals, which means the metal is in a current oxide state, metal oxide state, right? The more reactive the metal, the more stable the ore. So you take a look at uh, the top five metals from potassium all the way until aluminium. The top five can only be extracted by electrolysis because the reactive metal form highly stable ores or highly stable compounds that cannot be easily broken down. So I need to electrocute it in order to separate it. Okay, so for example, if my ore is K2O, how do I separate the K and the O? I need to use electrolysis to break it up into the metal itself, then separately the oxygen. So the first five electrolysis, your transition metal, zinc, iron, and lead can be uh, broken up or displaced by carbon. Okay, so if you go back to the question here, rubidium is in group one. So we will expect its reactivity to be high. So which method is most likely? We probably cannot just heat it with carbon or hydrogen. It has to be electrolysis. Now, the next question is, do we choose the term aqueous or do we choose the term molten? Okay, I need you to note that there's a slight difference. Usually when we are doing reduction by electrolysis for such metals, it is always about the molten state. Okay, so it's always, if you take a look at what's inside, it's always a molten compound. Okay, 
Um, so that's all you need to recall. So between molten and aqueous, you always choose the molten for electrolysis of metals. Okay, so that's about it for question eight. All right, next question nine, let's take a look. Uh, which reaction is dilute acid not behaving like an acid? Okay, uh, but before I move on, question eight, just a quick question. What's the difference between molten and aqueous? Molten means liquid state, solid liquid gas. Molten means liquid. Aqueous means we add in water. So aqueous is essentially a solution. That means water is inside. Okay, there's a difference between molten and aqueous. Okay, um, does it mean aqueous is not as reactive? No, this, is, this isn't about reactive, but this is about the choice of what your electrolysis is acting on. Okay, because you add in water, um, this one, you don't really learn it because in combined science, there isn't a chapter on electrolysis. Okay, But I think the main takeaway here is just remember, if we're doing electrolysis of a certain compound for extraction, it has to be in molten state. Okay, So I don't want to overcomplicate things. We keep things as per what we are required to know. All right. Now, question nine, um, which one, which of the options is not behaving like an acid, right? For this, we need to recap what are the three acid reactions that we're supposed to know. Right. So under acid reactions, okay, I need you to know that there are three chemical reactions, and that is acid metal, acid base, okay, which is neutralization, and lastly, acid carbonate. So these are the three main chemical reactions that are required to know that acid can undergo. Let's take a look at whether they appear here in the question. What is reaction one? Reaction one is technically neutralization, right? Reaction two doesn't look like anything, okay, which is why it's the answer. Lah, okay? Reaction C, this is acid plus base. So this is neutralization as well. Okay, This one, D is what? D is acid plus metal. That's why answer is B. Okay, Quick quiz. Ah. If you know the answer, you type in the chat. Ah. Anybody can recognize what reaction B is? Very good. Oh, Julia, there you go. Yes. Reaction B is precipitation because this is aqueous, aqueous to give you an insoluble silver chloride salt. Okay. So does B exist as a reaction? Yes, it is a real reaction. But in this reaction, your hydrochloric acid is not behaving like an acid. Okay. So instead, this is just a precipitation reaction. So if you want to, okay, please write that down. This is precipitation. But precipitation is not an acid reaction. Therefore, it's not the answer. Okay, next. Question 10, this is a question on indicators. So here, the question gave us the pH at which the indicator will have a change in color. Now, the terminology that you need to be familiar here is the term weak acid, strong alkaline. Okay, so what is the implied meaning when we talk about weak acid? Okay, so if you take a look at this neutralization curve that I've shown here, Weak acid, you need to know it doesn't start at pH 1 and 2. Okay, The max it could reach is probably like somewhere around pH 3. But when we are talking about a strong alkaline, strong alkaline is around pH 13. right? So this is 3, this is 13. So where is my midpoint around? The midpoint of a reaction or neutralization between a weak acid and a strong alkaline is around pH 9 which means when I do a certain reaction between weak and strong alkaline, the point in which it changes color is around pH 9. I know we are very used to the idea of, okay, acid alkaline neutral means pH 7. Yes, that is true if we are talking about a strong acid and a strong alkaline. Okay, but so I'll take a look at this. Uh. So this is in the curated notes, right? So if you take a look here, do you notice if you use a strong acid with a strong base here, right? Where does it neutralize? It neutralizes around pH 7. So this is the perfect case scenario, strong, strong. But in a case where we are dealing with a weak acid that starts at 3 and a strong alkaline that ends off at 13, your midpoint now shifts up to around pH 9. And when that happens and we go back to the question, since we know that it likely changes pH, neutralization points around pH 9, that's why we would use phenolphthalein as our choice of indicator. Okay, if it's between a weak acid and weak alkaline, then it will be at pH seven. Okay, so those are some of the different scenarios you might want to take note of. Okay.
Okay, question 11, which pair of reactants can safely prepare sodium nitrate? So do you all know what method to use and how many methods are there in the first place? Okay, so the number of methods for salt preparation, there's a total of three. So if you refer to the framework here, the three methods is precipitation, acid reaction, and titration. The question is asking us for sodium nitrate. Take note, for any spa salt, such as sodium nitrate, we prepare it using titration, which is essentially an acid and alkaline reaction. So it's neutralization, right? So we have to look for acid and alkaline. Therefore, answer is D. Okay, so for salt preparation, a lot of times um, we struggle with, uh, we kind of know the steps on how titration works, right? If you have the burette, you drip, 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 you know, everybody kind of get it. But the difficulty for salt preparation is understanding when to use which method, okay? So that comes with a more thorough understanding of what I'll call the salt preparation framework. Okay, so understanding that insoluble salt is prepared using precipitation. Uh, most salts that are soluble can be prepared using an acid reaction. Meanwhile, spa salt should be prepared using titration. Okay, next for question 12, this is obviously about rusting. I just need you to take note of two things, boiled water and salty water. What is implied here when we say boiled water? Boiled water means there is no more oxygen or no more air inside the water because all of the air has escaped in the form of bubbles, okay? Meanwhile, uh, what does salt water means? Salt water means that the rusting will occur faster. So if you just refer to the curated notes once again, you will note that the iron rusts the fastest in seawater, right? Because we have ions in seawater that helps to facilitate the progress of changing from iron to iron tree oxide. So you'll notice that those metals, right, those iron or those steel bars near the beach, they tend to rust a lot faster. Okay. Meanwhile, if it contains boiled water, what this means is that the water does not contain any more oxygen. So we know that rusting requires two things. It requires oxygen and water. Without either of them, we cannot rust. Okay. So let's take a look. Uh, can number one rust? Cannot. Why? Cause no water. This one, no oxygen. This one can, got air and water, ma. good news. Okay, four cannot, why? Because the grease portion of it serves as a protective layer. Salt water can rust, can. In fact, it will be the fastest. Zinc, it will not rust because the zinc acts as a sacrificial metal. So it will react in place of the iron. Therefore, answer should be D. Okay, so two things to take away are boiled water and salt water. What does that mean uh, when we are talking about rusting? Okay. Trends moving down group seven, which one is false, okay? Reactivity should decrease down group seven, okay? So this one is, you probably just need to revise. If you know it, you know it, right? If you don't know it, you're kind of in trouble, okay? But uh, next, question 14. So we have mineral ooze that's soft in water, okay? And then we heat it. Okay, the question now, right, is that when you see such a diagram, right, you might be struggling to find or to recall which exact reaction are we talking about here, right? We're like, what is going on, right? So the truth is that in order to know this reaction, you have to know your uh, concepts well, okay? And the one that I'm talking about is specifically your metal plus water reaction, okay? I go back to the question now, uh, where is the water? The water is here. When you heat this up, your water turns into steam. So this is essentially steam plus metal reaction. And we see bubbles, okay? So if you go back to the notes, right? What's going on? You take a look. Some metals can react with cold water, that's great, but some metals can react with steam, okay? And what does it produce when they react with steam? They produce hydrogen gas. So this is actually your metal plus steam reaction, okay? So this unknown gas is obviously hydrogen, okay? Between copper and zinc, which one should we choose, okay? Take note, uh, the last metal that can react with steam and it reacts very slowly is iron. Anything below iron in the reactivity series does not react with steam. So copper is below iron in the reactivity series, okay? Which is why if you go and take a look, okay, it will not react with steam. Okay, so cause see, copper is here, right? Then your iron is here. So anything below iron like lead and copper, they will not react with steam, which is why the answer here must be zinc. Okay, question 15, which one is incorrectly matched, okay? Carbon monoxide is not a greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide 
then it's a greenhouse gas. So don't mix up the two. Carbon monoxide is the one that binds with your hemoglobin that causes respiratory problems. Okay. Meanwhile, carbon dioxide and methane are your greenhouse gases. Okay. So make sure you get that right. Question 16, identify how the bolded element, okay, which one is correct. Okay. I'm just going to do the correct answer here, which is B. So for a compound that is K2Cr2O7, how do we calculate the oxidation state of Cr? Typically, I would like you to write out in a form of an equation. Okay, what do I mean? K is in group 1, so it has a charge of plus 1. O is in group 6. It tends to gain 2 electrons to have a charge of minus 2. Since there is 2K, so it will be 2 bracket plus 1. We do not know what is the oxidation state of Cr, so I'll just say plus 2X. X is the oxidation state. O, there's 7 of it. So we plus 7 minus 2. Since it's a compound, the net charge is zero. So if you go and work out your basic math, right, your sec one algebra, right, you'll find out that the oxidation state of Cr is actually plus six. Okay, because minus 14, two, right, then divided by two, 12 divided by two. That's why answer should be plus six. Okay, so this is calculating oxidation state of an element within the compound. Okay, question 17, this is about rate of reaction, okay? Let's take a look at the statements to decipher why it's true or false, okay? Rate of reaction is highest at the five second mark. This is true because if you were to plot out a gradient or a tangent along this line, this is the part where the gradient is the steepest, okay? Then sodium hydroxide, is it fully used up after 40 seconds? Yes, it is, right? Because from here onwards, you can see it's actually largely a flat line. So fully you start, true, okay? Uh, what about statement three? Rate of reaction decrease after 15 seconds? Right, because you can see that the gradient is slowly sloping down, right? So this is true and eventually comes to a stop. Once the volume of gas collector is constant, it means that the reaction has come to a halt. So this is true as well. Is ammonium hydroxide fully used up after 40 seconds? Okay, you need to go back to this question, right? If you read through this portion, we have excess ammonium chloride. What this implies is that excess means our some ammonium hydroxide that's left over. Okay, so very important for you to note that this is not true. Okay, if you're wondering, H, then isn't this ammonium chloride? It's because your sodium hydroxide has water, so you will form ammonium hydroxide as well. Okay, so it's pretty much the same thing. That's why C is true. Okay, question 18, almost done. Huh? So question 18, which is true for all metals, okay? So do, um, do all metals have high melting boiling point? This is not true because group one metals and also mercury, they have low melting boiling point. So this is not true. Not all, okay? Not all. Most metals have high melting boiling point. Which, do all metals exist in solid state? Not true because there is mercury. So mercury does not exist as a solid at room temperature and pressure. Are they good conductors of heat and electricity? Yes. Okay. Do they react with acid to produce hydrogen gas? Do all metals? Remember earlier we went to the reactivity series. Do you notice here we have, this is called unreactive metal? Right? So copper, silver, and gold are unreactive metal and they do not react with acid. Okay. Most metals do, but not all metals. So once again, this is not true. Therefore, answer should be A. Okay. Only, uh, so we cannot assume that all metals. Most doesn't mean all, okay? Question 19 here, when you put air and you heat up the copper, what happens is that your copper reacts with the oxygen to form copper oxide, right? So even though I have 100 cm cube of air, it's not that the entire 100 cm cube will react. Why do I say that? Because inside the sample of air, we know that there are other gases like nitrogen or carbon dioxide as well. Those gases, they do not react with the metal. Only oxygen does, okay? So here you see that after we react all the oxygen away, the volume of remaining gas is 75 cm cube. What this implies is that 25 cm cube of oxygen has reacted. So if I have 25 cm cube of oxygen inside a 100 cm cube of sample of air, it means that the percentage of oxygen is 25%. Okay, so if you ever see a question with this test tube and this metal and everything, okay, just
just recall that this is about percentage composition of air. Okay. Lastly, question 20, we add aqueous ammonium to a solution, we get a white precipitate which dissolves in excess. When you add barium nitrate, we get a white precipitate. This is your Q8. Okay. So if we were to go to your Q8 portion, okay, uh, what dissolves in excess aqueous ammonia? So you take a look, uh, aqueous ammonia is this second column here, right? Cause weak alkaline aqueous ammonia, right? The one that the only one that dissolves in excess aqueous ammonia is zinc. Okay, then for the second half, okay, we are asking we add in barium nitrate. Why do we add in barium nitrate? The reason why we add in barium nitrate is because I want my barium and my sulfate to react to produce the insoluble barium sulfate salt, which is white in color. So the reason why this white PPT is formed is because the insoluble salt has been formed. In this case, it is barium sulfate. So you actually don't have to memorize this part if you know your insoluble salts well. Okay. In fact, the test for sulfate and the test for chloride, both of them is about precipitation. Producing an insoluble salt like BASO4, AGCL, or PBCL. So this is the part here that I just mentioned. Okay, those with the notes, okay, you should know what I'm referring to. All right. So that's why what is present in the solution, okay. Firstly, we have this first test that tells us that zinc was present. And the second test that tells us that sulfate was present, right? So what is present? Zinc sulfate. Therefore, answer should be D. Okay. If you're wondering whether this is difficult or not, yes, I think this is slightly difficult. Okay. So um, but I think there are a lot of good points, good learning points here, but O-level paper should be slightly easier. Lah. Okay. So that's all for the MCQ. Um, no break yet because we only break after we move to physics. Ah. So let's push on and let's do paper three. Okay. Same thing. If you have questions, you can type in the chat. Uh, if it's a basic question, I'll address it straight away. Okay. Now, uh, let's first take a look at section A here. So section A, you're like, wow, I see already a bit headache, right? Why well, got like things like amount of metal concentration temperature. So let's do a basic breakdown and analyze this first. The amount of metals added is the same mass, but what is different is the state between solid and powder. Okay, now what we need to recognize here is that this is probably about rate of reaction, right? We know that powder form rate of reaction is faster. Okay, next, concentration, different. Okay, higher concentration also means higher rate of reaction, which means time taken should be lesser. Temperature, same thing. Higher temperature means faster rate of reaction. Okay, now let's take a look at the question. First, they ask us to predict a value and to explain it. So between B and C, take a look. It's still powdered form. Temperature is the same. But I use a higher concentration of sulfur acid. So what will you expect X to be like? You expect the rate of reaction to be faster, which means you expect the time taken to be lesser. So any value below 100 is reasonable. Okay. And if you need to explain it, you want to talk about how concentration, when it increases, there are more particles per unit volume. Okay. Higher frequency of collision, hence higher frequency of effective collision. Take note that rate of reaction is a very keyword heavy chapter. Okay, so if you refer to the curated notes, right, you'll notice that the way I structured the chapter is very precise in terms of getting you to explain with all the keywords involved. You can see here, right? So each box, you can think of it as half a mark. If you get the keywords right, then you definitely will get the mark. Okay, so that is for part A. Uh, part B, explain the time difference in time taken for experiment A and B. The main difference would be about solid versus powder. So this one, once again, if you go back to the notes, okay, solid versus powder, which one? It's about the surface area to volume ratio. This one. Okay, so if you go back to the answer, you take note, the keywords here would be when they are in powder form. Okay, greater exposed surface area to volume ratio. Higher number of reactant particles will collide. Frequency of collision increase. Frequency of effective collision increases. Therefore, okay, time taken would be lesser because rate of reaction is faster. So once again, rate of reaction, keywords, keywords, keywords. 
can't stretch this enough. Okay, so how would the value of x be? Will it be greater or smaller than y? Okay, so you expect that x would be a bigger value than y. Okay, why? What's the reason? Because if you compare the temperature, y is at a higher temperature, which means higher rate of reaction. So same thing once again is about all about the keywords. Okay, temperature increase, average kinetic energy increases. They move faster. Collision increase and more particles have sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy barrier. So you take a look here, the way it's being structured, okay, you need to explain via both tracks, okay, then how it leads to a higher rate of reaction. Okay, so that's for question one. Question two, this is a very common type of question. There isn't a specific chapter here, uh, but it's really about um, combining and understanding your different substances. Lah. So I'll just go through this very quickly. A uh, high temperature in car engine, you form nitrogen dioxide. Another way you can form nitrogen dioxide is via the lightning. Okay. Uh, next, zinc oxide is because zinc oxide is an amphoteric oxide. Okay. White precipitate when added to aqueous silver nitrate. Remember, silver, white precipitate. What is this white precipitate? We are talking about silver chloride, which is your insoluble salt. Therefore, you need something with chloride, therefore hydrochloric acid. Titration is for spa salts, so sodium nitrate. Acid carbonate to produce carbon dioxide gas. Okay, turning your uh, litmus paper red when added to ammonium nitrate. Question mark. What is happening is an alkaline plus ammonium salt reaction, producing ammonia gas. Okay, this is one of the reactions that I think students tend to miss out quite a bit when they are doing acid bases. Okay. Which reaction am I talking about? Um, specifically referring to... Okay, where is it? Here, this reaction. Okay, this second reaction on the page. Okay, if you want, you can put an asterisk or write this down. Okay, take note that when alkaline react with something that contains ammonium, you will produce ammonia gas. Okay, so the question here is asking us what can turn my litmus paper red to blue? you need ammonia gas. So what can I react with ammonium nitrate? I need to react it with a strong alkaline. Okay, if you write aqueous ammonia, you will not get a mark because you need a strong alkaline for this to happen. Okay, right? Question three, the nightmare of all our dreams, right? Blast furnace, right? So you need to know that your hematite is actually your iron oxide. Okay, and in part B, this is one of the classic, right? You know when it's about blast furnace, it will be about the equation. Okay, I think the reason why a lot of students, we dread blast furnace is because when we take a look at blast furnace, we think about, okay, I need to memorize a lot of equations. That is annoying, right? Nobody likes to memorize equations. So what I'm going to do in the next two minutes is to try my best, okay, uh, in this short period of time to explain to you how does blast furnace work and hopefully the memorization process is made easier, okay? So what we're trying to do in the very first step is to produce carbon dioxide, okay? How do we do so? The coke that we add forms carbon dioxide and the calcium carbonate in the form of limestone decomposes to form carbon dioxide. Now, why do we need to produce so much carbon dioxide? Isn't there carbon dioxide in the air already? Air carbon dioxide composition is very low, which means not enough. So I need to spam and create a lot of carbon dioxide. But what for? is because this carbon dioxide would then further react with my carbon to form carbon monoxide. So the main culprit or the main thing I'm trying to produce is actually carbon monoxide. And why do I need carbon monoxide? Is because my carbon monoxide is the one that's responsible for changing my iron oxide into iron, right? The whole point of the blast furnace is for the oxide to convert into its metal form, right? This is called extraction of metal. Who is responsible for this? Your calcium, calcium monoxide is responsible to reduce your iron oxide. Therefore, we need the carbon monoxide. And I cannot get carbon monoxide unless I do the first three steps. Okay. Lastly, take note, once you decompose, yes, the carbon dioxide is used, but there's still this weird guy, this calcium oxide. What's his role? His role comes in in the form of getting rid of your impurity, which exists in the form of silicon oxide. So when these two react, you form slick, okay? So slick is a compound that you want to get rid of, okay? That lies above your iron itself, okay? So hopefully these five equations start to make a bit more sense 
from the explanation. So it's not about purely memorizing, but it helps a lot if you understand why is the equations as such. Okay. Um, this one I will not explain. So oxidation state from plus three to zero, therefore reduce. A balance equation between acidic and a base. Calcium oxide is a non, sorry, it's a metal oxide. So it should be basic oxide, which is a base. Okay. So this is your base. Silicon dioxide, this is a non-metal oxide, so it's an acidic oxide. Okay, so therefore answer is this. Okay, moving on. Question four, um, acid rain formation. Take note, acid rain formation is not just your pollutants dissolving in water. Take note, there's oxygen as well. Okay, so you'll form two of your more familiar acids in the form of sulfuric acid as well as nitric acid. Okay, negative effects of acid rain, just go and study. How to reduce acidity, you can either use slick lime or limestone. Okay, now, assuming we want the crops to grow best at pH 7, should I add in calcium carbonate or calcium hydroxide? Okay, the answer to this is that we should use calcium carbonate. Why? It's because calcium carbonate produces salt, water, and carbon dioxide. Even if I add excess calcium carbonate, it's okay because the pH would be limited at pH 7. Meanwhile, if I choose to use an alkaline like calcium hydroxide, it might cause the pH to shoot into the alkaline range, making it too alkaline for the crops to grow well. So this means that between the two choices, if I just want to limit my pH to pH 7, calcium carbonate is a much better choice. Okay, and part E, if you are having, you're doing this on the paper, help me put the asterisk here, because this is a super important question. Why do I say so? This is the one of my favorites, okay? Because once again, this is about the alkaline plus ammonium salt reaction. The one that I highlighted earlier before as well. Okay, sorry, let me scroll. Huh? The, this one, remember? So when you add alkaline with something that contains ammonium, you produce salt water and ammonia gas. So you take a look at this reaction here. What's the issue? Why is it a problem? Is because the fertilizer contains your ammonium chloride. Okay. Then at the same time, you want to add in an alkaline solution. So what happens is that your alkaline will react with your ammonium salt to produce ammonia gas. So instead of your crops getting to absorb the nitrogen within your fertilizer, your fertilizer, the nitrogen is being released in the form of ammonia. Furthermore, your alkaline is reacted away. So it's not really helping to neutralize the acid. Okay, so this is the worst case scenario. If I'm a farmer and I do this, you know what's happening? My whole farm will just be damn smelly because it will smell like ammonia. Okay, so this is something to avoid. It's quite a commonly tested question. So you might want to pay special attention to it. Okay, oxidation state, I won't go through again. It will be using a similar technique as what I've mentioned earlier in terms of writing out the equations. Okay. Um, based on change in oxidation state, whether manganese has undergone oxidation or reduction, take note of the answering technique here. You want to say plus two in manganese nitrate to plus four in manganese oxide. Therefore, oxidation. You don't. You cannot just say oxidation state increase from plus two to plus four. Okay, because that's an incomplete answer. Plus two in where to plus four in where. So you want to make sure that you mention that clearly. Okay. Once again, oxidation state. Okay, and identify the substance that got reduced. Chlorine got reduced because the oxidation state turned from zero in Cl2 to minus one in Cl minus. Okay, so um, the technique I covered it earlier when I was going through the MCQ is about writing the X one. So I just go a quick example here, MnO4. So MnO4 minus, how you should write this X? O is minus two. So it's plus four minus two. The charge is minus one. So this is minus one. Then you solve for X. So oxidation state of MN should be six. Mm -hmm. So it should be seven, right? Because minus eight, you bring over eight minus one. X is seven. So the oxidation state of X, sorry, of NN, which is X should be seven. Okay. So that is the technique that I was mentioning earlier. Question six, QA. Okay. I know when we see QA, we kind of feel a bit intimidated. But even if you're not able to answer the full question, answer the parts, okay? And make intelligent guesses, okay? So let's talk about what's going on here, okay? So um, first thing first, 
take a look at the thing, okay? Try to identify the easiest part to solve, okay? And to me, it's quite obvious this is the one, right? Because when we add magnesium, we get a gas that extinguishes a lighted spin. This is H2 for sure. So what is B likely to be? We can now confirm that B is probably an acid, right? Acid metal, hydrogen gas. Next, you take a look at the left side here. Colorless gas, wow, our favorite word come out. Lime water, happy, right? Why? Because we know that this is probably going to be carbon dioxide bubbling into lime water to form. Why is this white precipitate? You can take a look here, right? So when carbon dioxide reacts with your lime water, which is calcium hydroxide, it produces the white precipitate, which is your calcium carbonate. Okay, so already solved by C and E. Okay, next. Acid plus something give me carbon dioxide. We know now that A is probably a carbonate. Okay, but we don't know what yet. So let's take a look. It forms D, okay, barium nitrate. Barium, white precipitate. What is this white precipitate? Likely to be our barium sulfate. So D probably contains sulfate. And if you work backwards, that means your acid that you use was H2SO4. Okay, next. It excess equals ammonia, it gives you a colorless solution. What does this mean? Okay, going back to QA, if you just check your notes, zinc is the only one that dissolves in excess equals ammonia. Okay, so that means G is zinc. Zinc what? It should be zinc hydroxide, okay, which is your colorless solution. Okay, now if you work backwards here, okay, you already saw for F, which is barium sulfate. Okay, we know that it has sulfate and now it has zinc. So this is zinc sulfate. So what does it make this carbonate be? This is zinc carbonate. That's how you solve. Okay, so a lot of times you actually need to work backwards from your endpoint to figure out, but most importantly is recognizing that QA uses a lot of the, the knowledge that you need. So when your teacher asks you to memorize, it's so that you can apply it to such questions. So in fact, if you are doing revision for QA, I highly suggest you don't just memorize and regurgitate. I rather you try questions to see if you can apply those knowledge. So you try questions, you can recall everything well. This is known as a technique of memorization known as active recall, right? Rather than you just study and then you close the book, you try to actively recall the information to see if it really stuck with you. So I know for content heavy chapters, there's quite a few in chemistry. This, is, this might be the best way to approach it. Study, try questions. Study, try questions. Then you see if it sticks. If it sticks, it usually doesn't go away. Okay, at least not in the next six weeks uh, before your O-level. Okay, uh, precipitation I already mentioned, forming an insoluble salt. Section B, almost there, so let's push through. Okay, for section B, the numbers, I think all of this you can calculate on your own. Take note that for titration, we always use the best of the two closest value, right? So 7.9, 7.9, so I just use 17.9, sorry. Okay, so how do we find concentration? We just need to take, okay, the volume multiplied by concentration to find more. Then we compare more ratio based on the chemical equation, one is to one. Then from there, we can find the concentration by taking more divided by volume. That's how I get my concentration of my X hydroxide. Okay, they told us that X hydroxide is 13.26 grams per dm cube. Here I have more per dm cube. So how was their relationship? We can find MR if we take mass divided by mole. Okay, why? It's because mole equals to mass over MR, right? So how do I find MR? MR is mass over mole. And when I do that, I recognize that, hey, my MR of XOH is 74. So if I subtract away the MR of OH2, X is actually MR 40, therefore it is calcium. Okay, but what's the reason why this is not a good way to prepare calcium hydroxide? is because calcium hydroxide is a, sorry, calcium sulfate is a insoluble salt, okay? Therefore, it should be prepared using precipitation, right? If you go back up, take note, if this is XO4 and it's calcium, calcium sulfate is an insoluble salt. So we should not be using titration, but rather we should be using precipitation. Okay, question eight, this is about empirical formula. Take note that the box itself should be your working. What goes into your box, okay? You need mass, MR. Mass divided by MR gives you more. Then you find the simplest ratio, okay? 
Uh, this is the working is also included in the curated notes. Okay, so the step by step instruction on how to do it and different question types. Okay, but you take note the boxes are always there, right? Because the boxes are your working itself. Okay, um, ions rusting conduct the balance equation here. So because the iron here is iron three oxide, so you need to form an equation where it reacts with water and hydrogen. Okay, how do we prevent rust? We use surface protection things like paint, oil, and plastic, and plating to protect our iron from being exposed to water and oxygen. Okay, what reaction is this? Okay, uh, here you will notice that when aluminium reacts with iron oxide, this is a displacement reaction. Why? Because aluminium is more reactive than iron, aluminium would displace it. Okay, at the same time, if you say it's a redox reaction, it's fine as well, because aluminium is oxidized while iron is reduced. Okay, lastly, how do we extract aluminium is via electrolysis. Iron is via heating with carbon. Why? It's because if you take a look at the whole reactivity series, okay, you'll notice that above carbon means it's extracted by electrolysis. Below carbon, it means that carbon can displace it. So I'm talking about the chapter in metals, okay, uh, specifically this portion here. You take note at the position of carbon. Because carbon is more reactive than iron. So carbon can theoretically displace the metal from their metal oxide, which is why we can use heating with carbon to get iron out from iron oxide. But anything above carbon, carbon cannot displace them, right? Because carbon is less reactive. So for those that are above carbon, we use electrolysis. Therefore, the answer is part E as such. Okay, I'll pause here for a short while. Okay, um, so you can ask me some questions. Okay, if not, we'll be taking a break after this. If somebody asks, will you be what will you be teaching on Saturday? So for those that were sitting in earlier, I think Sing Wei shared that we will be having a chemistry bio online crash course this Saturday. Uh, I'll be mainly going through the key concepts as well as highlighting commonly tested questions. Uh, for chem physics students, uh, it would be. 25th September, same thing. I'll be going through key concepts and commonly tested 10 year series questions. Okay, so that will be what is covered during the crash course. Okay, not related to this mock paper review. Group two metals are just group two metals, they don't have a special name. Okay, group one metals, we call them alkaline metals. Okay, if you have no questions, you can go for a quick break. Uh, I'll start the physics one at 9.05, okay? For my chem bio students, okay, uh, thank you for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. Um, I think most importantly, hopefully this paper review can give you more of a teacher insight, right? Perspective from a tutor in terms of how papers should be approached, what are the things to look out for? And using this session, making it a good way for you to review your content as well, to spot areas of weakness and serve as a preparation for your O-level. So you're six weeks away, so... Uh, there's not a lot of time, but a determined student with a plan can do a lot. So I wish you all the best for all the Chem Bio students, right? To make the best use of your time. Okay, of course, if you want to attend the crash course, um, do so. I mean, it is up to you like, entirely. Uh, we'll send you a copy of the curated notes in advance as well. Okay, so that's uh, all for the Chem Bio students. Okay, uh, for the Chem Physics students, uh, stay with me because the second half of Physics will do so shortly. Okay, a... What chapter is empirical formula in? Empirical formula is in more concept. Okay. Question 16, MCQ. Can you demonstrate how to calculate oxidation state for option A? Okay, let's go there. Question 16. Okay, so here I already did the working. So I'll just go back to the working as reference. So K2Cr207. K is plus one. There's two of it. That's why I write two bracket plus one. I do not know the oxidation state of Cr, so I write X, right? And there's two of it, so two X. Oxygen has charge of minus two, there's seven of them, so seven bracket minus two. This is a compound, compounds do not have a charge, so it's equals to zero. I just need to solve for X, and X is equals to plus six. So this is how you determine the oxidation state of your element within the compound. 
Okay, why is it that for 8E, you don't talk about the bonds between iron and oxygen being weaker? <clears throat> to explain that, okay, so for 8E, let's go over to 8E. Oh, the last question. Okay, so this one is because they are asking us to reference the reactivity series. You see? So if you want to talk about the bond strength, I think that is fine too. But I think it'll be a lot easier if you just talk about the reactivity in relation to why, whether it displays or not. Okay, Ken? No problem, Julia. Good question. Okay, group two metals is really not an uh, important thing to pay attention to, purely because in our syllabus, we are mainly focusing on group one, group seven, and group eight. Okay, so group two metals, you just roughly need to know. Okay, question five, MCQ. Let's take a look. Okay, question five. Okay, so why is the last option not true? Okay, so when we take a look at A and D, A it is plus one, D it is minus one. So the electrostatics between plus one and minus one. Okay, then if you take a look at B and C, B is in group two, so it's plus two and minus two. So plus two and minus two, the electrostatic force of attraction would be stronger. So B, C is stronger than A, D which is why statement D is not true. Okay, if you're wondering the more detailed explanation for this, this is under chemical bonding. Okay, so if you head over to chemical bonding, right? Under some of the more commonly tested questions here, you would see that here, I'm trying to attempt to compare between calcium oxide and sodium chloride. So this is between two plus two minus, this is between plus one and minus one, right? So you will see here that the electrostatic force of attraction between 2 plus 2 minus is stronger than between plus 1 and minus 1. So that's the reason why, okay, and this is how we should be analyzing it, okay? So that is for this question here, for part D. Okay, if not, uh, I think I will just give a quick pause here because I also need to take a short break. So come back at 9.05 and we'll start on the physics paper, okay? For those that haven't downloaded it, okay, head over to the Telegram channel to download it, okay? So now we are taking a look at question one. Okay, so question one, this is definitely about our vernier caliper. So not only understanding how to measure a reading, but understanding zero as error as well. Okay, now for zero error, I need you all to be very careful of something. So let me just show you all the notes, okay, uh, under the portion for vernier caliper. So for vernier caliper, I need you all to be very careful because you need to remember for negative zero error, right, what we do, is we read from the back, okay? So if you take a look at this question here, right? Let me close the chemistry one first. Okay, so if you take a look at the question here, do you notice that in diagram one, what is showing is actually a negative zero error? Why do I say that? It's because the small ruler zero is in front of the big ruler zero. And the line which is a line is actually the third line here. So instead of saying it's a negative 0 0.030 error, I count from the back, right? So what is happening here is actually a negative 0 0.070 error. Then if I do a normal reading in diagram two, I'll get 8.06. So what do I do with my negative zero error? I subtract my zero error. So essentially I'll get 8.13, okay? If not in question two, which of it is not a vector quantity? Speed is not a vector quantity, okay? Speed is a scalar quantity because speed does not take into account the direction. It only cares about magnitude. How do you know if there's a zero error? If the big zero, the zero on the big ruler doesn't align with the zero on the small ruler, it means there is a zero error, okay? So it's either a positive or negative zero error. Yes, it's about the alignment of it. Okay, it means your device is faulty. So you need to try to correct that via calculation, okay? For question three, right? If the question doesn't give you a graph when you're doing something that's related to speed time, you draw in your own graph. That's like the technique, right? So you take a look at the graph here. How do we find average speed? Is about total distance over total time. How do we find total distance for a speed time graph? Okay, you take a look at the area underneath the graph. So you calculate the area underneath the graph divided by total time, which is 10 seconds. That's how you get your answer. Okay, question four. 
just remember this thing. Uh. If you see the term constant speed, I want you to remember something. Okay, Constant speed, what this means is that acceleration is zero. You see the question is asking us for resultant force, correct? F equals to MA. F refers to resultant force. Okay, Now, if my acceleration is zero, regardless of what my mass is, my resultant force will always be zero. So for an object that's traveling at constant speed, resultant force is always zero. Okay, this is a very common question at O levels and a lot of students fall into this trap. So I want you to remind yourself, okay, to not make this mistake. Constant speed, no acceleration, no resultant force. Okay, make sure you get this right. Huh? In the exam, if you see this right, you can think of me. Okay, if you think of me, then you'll be like, okay, I remember Daryl said this. Okay, then you won't make the mistake. Okay, doesn't really matter what his weight is. He can wear gear, he can have a uh, three oxygen tank, doesn't matter. Constant speed means zero resultant first. Okay, this one is very straightforward. This is just referring to inertial, right? And inertial is only affected by one and one factor only. And that is your mass. Nothing else, not weight, because weight can change on different planet. But mass is the only thing that affects inertial. Okay, full stop. Question six. Okay, this is a question obviously about principle of moments, right? So if we want this to be um, balanced, we need clockwise to be equal to anti-clockwise. But in this question here, you see that they're asking for resultant moment. What this means is that it's not balanced. That means there is tilting one way or the other. So how do we do this question? So here we take a look. They, tell, they told us that the beam is 2.4 meters, right? Which means the midpoint here is at the 1.2 meter mark. Okay, so clockwise. What is clockwise? Clockwise would be this 300 Newton with a perpendicular distance of 0 0.4 meters. So you take 300 times 0 0.4. That is clockwise. Okay, then what about anti-clockwise? You take 200 times 0 0.8. Okay, after you get the two values, okay, you then need to go and calculate. Is there more clockwise or more anti-clockwise? You realize that there's more clockwise, okay? So it should be clockwise by how much more? By 40, okay? So you go and do your basic calculation, you should be able to get the answer. Clockwise and anti-clockwise, then you compare the values. Okay, question seven is a trick question, okay? Why? It's because normally when you see this question, right? If you do enough papers and you don't read the question carefully, you will think that, okay, if I'm going out the slope, my KE is being converted to GPE. Then you're like, oh, okay, I got the answer. Answer should be uh, KE decrease, potential energy increase. You choose A. But that's not the case here because if you read the question, right, the man is riding the bicycle and he's accelerating up the slope. So what this means, right, is that his speed is increasing because it's accelerating. So half mv square, if your v square is increasing, your kinetic energy should be increasing. And obviously, because he's going up the slope, his vertical height is increasing, his gravitational potential energy will increase as well. So never assume that you know the question, read the question, and then you decide accordingly. So these are the kind of questions whereby even smart students, in fact, it's the smarter students that tend to make the mistakes because they assume they already know what the question's about. Okay, so don't be tricked by such questions. Read your question, every single question. Okay, now is the pandemic. You get pretty lot of ninja van delivery okay um, um that's why here we take a look at the question okay power what is power power is actually work done over time work done how much 60 kg 25 kg 85 kg okay but kg is useless because we need to convert this to mass right so sorry mass we need to convert it to weight so w equals to mg so this is m this is g my weight is 850 Newton. So this is my force. Okay, force times distance is work done. So this is 850. Okay, what's my distance? Vertical height of 30 meters. So what I do is I take 850 times 30 divided by time. Now, if you see time, you see two minutes, right? Your goosebump hair need to stand. Why? Because you know exactly that there's going to be a proportion of students that's going to do a divide by two. And then trust me, the answer will be one of the options. And then a lot of people, they're going to get the wrong answer. Then they're like, ah, why wrong? I careless. When you see minutes, take note that the unit of time is not minutes, but it should be in seconds. 
So two minutes, we always convert it to 120 seconds. That's how you get your correct answer for A. So I emphasize again, uh, power is per unit time. Unit of time is in seconds. Don't ever, ever make these mistakes. Once again, something very tricky, something quite small, in fact, but something I want you to take note of after today's session. Okay, question nine, this is about convection, obviously, right? So freezer compartments on the top. So what happens to the freezer compartment? Uh, do the particles become smaller? No, la, the particles are always the same size. It's just that they move closer together. So the density increases. That's why it sinks. Okay, so answer should be C. Boiling evaporation, you just need to know your stuff. So how many differences are we comparing between boiling and evaporation? So let me just bring out the notes because uh, I'm a bit lazy to explain. But here you see this table, right? These are the key differences between boiling and evaporation. Okay, then if you study this, okay, then you go back to the question, which one is true? This one and this one. Okay, this one not true. Boiling occurs throughout the liquid. Evaporation doesn't need a source of energy. When you see such a question, right, there's one thing mainly that I need you to remember. Whenever you're doing a question for light, we always, always need to draw in the normal, okay? So you see that normal is not drawn for us. That's when we know that, hey, I got to draw it myself, okay? Do it yourself, right? DIY, okay? So 120, ta -da, that means this is 30. 40, I don't really care about this 40. Why? It's because the angle here is always between the light ray and the normal. So this is the 50, okay? So I'm dealing with 30 and 50 here. If your school taught you n equals to sine i over sine r, and you just do sine 30 over sine 50 here, you'll get the wrong answer. Okay, then you'll be like, huh, is sine i, sine r wrong? Okay, uh, how I prefer you to approach this is that sine i should always be the angle in air. Meanwhile, sine r should always be the angle in glass. The direction of your arrow doesn't really matter due to principle of reversibility. So what you want to remember here is that your value of n must always be bigger than one. It cannot be smaller than one. Okay? So what you want to recall here is air over your medium. So in this case, what I want to do is my sine i is not sine 30, but rather sine 50 over sine medium. In this case, the glass, which is 30. This will give you the correct answer. Okay, sine C over sine V, uh, is it the same thing? That's different because what we are talking about here exactly in Nature's is right, is refractive index equals to C over V. What is C? What is V? You're like confused, confused question mark, question mark, right? Okay, so those values, there are a couple of them to calculate refractive index. There's sine I, sine R, speed of light in vacuum over speed of light in medium, real depth over apparent depth. These are all ways to calculate refractive index. Okay, so take note, sine i, sine r here is better remembered as sine air over sine medium. Okay, that's how you get your answer. Anyway, even if you do 30 over 50, right, you just need to remember that the value cannot be sm uh, smaller than one. If it's smaller than one, you flip your value around. Okay, so refractive index will always be bigger than one. I can explain this, but it requires an A-level concept called Snell's Law, which we don't want to bother ourselves with because we're not doing A-level, right? So just remember, it's always sine air over sine medium, okay? Uh, which is true for total internal reflection, okay? So um, this is not true, okay? Um, it does not only travel uh, when light travel from optically denser medium to air and vacuum. Total internal reflection can also work as long as it's traveling from optically denser to optically less dense. The less dense need not be necessarily air and vacuum even though that's what we are most comfortable with, okay? So as long as it's denser to less dense, that's fine, okay? Need not, the less dense does not have to be air, okay? Total internal reflection, yes, when I is greater than critical angle, yes. Okay, so these two are true, okay? Uh, yes, and also only applies when you're comparing two mediums where air is not one of them, okay? Now, what is wrong with statement four? Take note here, it says denser to less dense. What is missing? It should be, optically denser to optically less dense, right? Because optical density is about the speed of light in the medium. Density is mass over volume. So in other words, if the 
is a section A question asking you to state the conditions for total internal reflection. Okay, don't forget that you always have to include the word optical density. So optically denser, to optically less dense. Okay, question 13, right? This is a blurry image, right? Because the point of intersection, the sharpest image where all the light rays converge is here, but the screen is here. So you get a very blurred image. So how do we make sure that the image is sharper? Okay, one way is we can move the screen all the way to this point, right? Move the screen forward. But that's not, that's not an option here. Another way is to use a lens of a longer focal length, such that the, in the point of... So instead of F being here, F is here. So you use longer focal length, the image will form further away. So the image will be sharp on the screen. Okay. So you know some of you in your classroom, you have projectors, right? After the teacher projects, sometimes you have to adjust the lens, right? So what you're adjusting is the focal length, such that the image sharply captures on your projector screen. Okay, this is a similar situation, which is why sometimes when you just turn it on, it's blurry. It's because the focal length is not correct. Okay, for those of you that didn't have to adjust this because the distance is always the same. So you only need to adjust it once. Okay, question 14, loudness and pitch. This is one of the most classic questions. Okay, loudness is determined by amplitude. Pitch is determined by frequency. So what does different loudness mean? It means different amplitude. Same pitch means same frequency. Since V equals to F lambda, if my frequency is the same, I will have the same speed. Okay, that's about it. Okay, question 15, this is echo, right? So echo, you need to remember, is always there and back. Okay, so you, you already have the time taken for speed of sound in air. So you just need to take time taken to hit this one and then time taken for the longer one. Then the time interval is one second. Okay, light charges attract, unlike light, light charges repel, unlike charges attract. So if this is minus, this is plus. These two are repel, repelling each other, so plus, plus. These two repelling, so plus. So answer should be B. EMF definition, okay, this one you just need to know. Okay, so what is the definition for EMF? Dun, dun, dun. Still don't know, right? Still don't know, you're in trouble. <laughs> need to go revise. Okay, so definition for EMF is over here. Work done by the source in driving a unit charge around a complete circuit. Okay, not power, but work done. Okay, EMF is always referring to the source to drive charge around the circuit, not your electron. Okay, question 18. Okay, if you see this question, and you're like, wow, my head hurts. Right, what's going on? You just need to redraw the circuit in a way that you can remember. So what I always do, right, is I first draw out the battery, right? So then I follow the path of the current. So I follow the path. When it hits here, it splits, right, into two lanes. If I take the upper lane, what do I see? I'll see this and this, right? 6 ohm and 4 ohm, okay? Then after that, I join back. So here. Then if I take the lower path, it goes through one light bulb that is... 5 ohm. So this is technically my circuit. So if the circuit ever looks too, like, too, too complicated, you can redraw the circuit in such a way that you understand it. Okay. So here, 6 and 4, rather than looking at 6 and 4, I can combine the both of them to become 10 ohm because they are in series. Okay. I know this is a parallel circuit, but at least within this branch, it is series. They are side by side. So instead of looking at 6 and 4, in total, it is 10 ohm. Then all I need to do is 1 over R equals to 1 over 5 plus 1 over 10. Then you solve for R. Lah, okay? Once you get R, you're halfway there. You're not yet done, right? Because once you find R, you'll get the total current. Okay? Then how much current actually flows through this? Okay? That's another question, right? So that is one way you could do it. But I'm going to introduce you to a faster way of solving this. Okay? This is going to sound a little bit more complicated, but follow me through. Okay, so for parallel circuits, okay, we know that the potential difference across each branch is the same, right? So potential difference across a parallel circuit <coughs> is equal across each branch. That means whether I go through the first, second, or third lane is always equal. So if I go back to this question, what this means is that the potential difference across the top lane and the bottom lane is equal. That part, you all got it? Okay, so if I see my 10 ohm as a single resistor, 
and they know, and the question already told me that this is 12 volt. What this means is that the potential difference of my top branch is 10 volt. And I also know that the resistance here, it is, hey, sorry, it's not 10, it's 12. What am I talking about? <laughs> 12 volt, right? Battery is 12 volt. So 12 volt for the top lane, 12 volt for the bottom lane. Okay, so here the current that's passing through, how do we find out? Because we know it's 12 volt and we know that the total resistance is 10. So if V equals to IR, I do not know my I, but I know my R, which is 10 ohm. So how much is I? I is 1.2. What am I calculating now? I'm calculating the current. Okay, and how do I find the current? It's because I know that the voltage across the first branch is 12 volts. Okay, the voltage across the bottom branch is also 12 volt. And since I got a voltage and I also got resistance, I can find the current. Therefore, answer is 1.2. Okay, so this is the faster way of solving this question. You could also solve it by finding out the resistance, finding the current, and then finding how your current splits. But that is a longer method. So I'm just teaching you the faster method here. Okay. Okay, question 19, another circuit diagram. You're like, oh my God, headache, right? Okay, yes, it's a headache, but don't worry too much about this. Okay, why do I say so? It's because if you take a look at this question, it can be quite straightforward. How do I say so? Here you have five and two. We know that current splits. What this tells us is that the total current is originally seven ampere. With that, you're almost done. Why do I say so? It's because all you need to calculate next is the resistance then I just need to take IR, then I can find V. How much is the resistance? I settle this 2 and 5 first. So 1 over 2, 1 over 5, 1 over R. After you find how much is your R effective, okay, you just need to plus 1. Why? Because there's a 1 ohm resistor here. Once you find R, you use V equals to IR. Where V is 7, then you have your R, you can find how much is your EMF. Okay, the truth is for DC circuits, it comes with a bit of practice. You kind of need to know your content in terms of how electricity and voltage works. And then once you get it, you try a few questions. The question types can vary a bit, but touch D will always be the same. Okay, so that is for DC circuits. And for question 20, once again, okay, uh, kilowatt per hour. So what we do here is we firstly take the kilowatt, okay, which is this times hours. Okay, they tell us the cost, right? So you just need to divide accordingly to find out how much one unit of electricity costs. Okay, this one should be quite okay. Lah. Just did some basic math skills. Okay, so that's for paper one. I think I deliberately included a few more tricky questions that I want you to remember and take note of. And if it really does appear in your O-level, please, please, please don't make the mistake. Okay? Okay, I see a question here from Nisa. You mentioned that size of particle never change when talking about convection current, expansion. Okay, when we say expand, right? Yes, it means that the particles move away from each other. Therefore, the volume expands and it becomes less dense. Okay, give you some tips. Huh? So if you want to look at how to explain convection. Okay. So going back to the curated notes here. What we would do normally is when we say a liquid is heated, it expands in volume, it becomes less dense, and it rises. Then the cooler liquid that is denser would sink. Okay, so uh, uh, Ignatius is right to point out that volume expanding is the reason why it becomes less dense, because the particles move away from each other. The particle size remains unchanged, because the particle is just a particle, right? But whether the particle move away from each other, that is dependent on whether it's being heated or not. But the particle size does not change. Okay, so that is for that question. Okay, good question though. All right, now, uh, if not, let's power through. We are done with paper one. We are left with paper two. Okay, so let's go through some of the key learning points from paper two, and I'm going to highlight them to you. Okay, so first thing first, okay, first question. We see a velocity time graph. Okay, what I need you to know, sorry, question 20. Do we have to convert kilowatt per hour to kilowatt? Um, no, you don't have to because you just need to calculate how many units of electricity you use and then you go and compare with the cost to find out per unit of electricity, which is kilowatt per hour, how much is it, okay? Um, 
For section A here, average speed means total distance over total time. So how do we calculate total distance? You need to calculate the total area underneath the graph for both the positive and the negative region because distance, we do not care about the direction, right? So distance covered here, I count, okay? Distance covered here, I also count. So total distance is 80, average speed total distance divided by total time. Average velocity, however, I do not use total distance, but I use total displacement. Now, anything in the positive region above the x-axis is moving in the forward direction. While anything in the negative region means it's moving in the backward direction. So if you're comparing and calculating what is displacement, you should take the positive minus the negative. That is your displacement. Okay. So what I did here was that I did exactly what I said, top minus bottom to give you your total displacement. Then you get displacement divided by time to find average velocity. Area underneath graph represents different things in velocity, time, and speed time graph, right? For velocity time graph, it represents displacement in the forward and in the backward direction. But for a speed time graph, you will not get anything in the negative region, right? Because I don't care about the direction. So the graph will look like that instead. Two lumps, both above the x-axis. Because when you change this to speed, right? I only care about how much I travel. I don't really care about which direction I'm going, okay? Uh, yes, displacement is distance with direction. I'll prefer to, for you to think about displacement as start point and end point, right? So if I start and I end at the same point, my displacement is zero, okay? Instantaneous speed, you just need to read it from the graph law. So one second is here, right? So between zero to 10, one second, this is five, okay? So uh, this question, uh, for those of you that have the curated notes, is actually from the curated notes. Though. So if you want a more detailed explanation and a bit more examples, okay? You can refer to the curated notes. There's a couple more of them, okay? Um, next. Okay, the ball throw in the air one. Um, ball throw in the air, I keep it simple. Huh? Because gravity is pulling you down, when it's going up, it will slow down until a point where it comes to a momentary pause. Then it starts to accelerate downwards. Basketball jump ball, right? The ball go up. Suddenly, like it's almost stationary at a certain point, at a certain instance, then it starts to accelerate down. So when a ball is thrown up into the air, uh, just take note that the acceleration is constantly downwards. It's just that you start off at the initial velocity. So how would the graph look like, right? I'll just draw it very quickly. Yeah? So if this is your graph, this is how it will look. Maybe when you start throwing your hand very strong, oh, you throw at 20 meter per second. Nice. But then when it's going up, this is still in the upward direction, right? By slowing down. This is the point where the ball reached the highest height. From here onwards, the ball will be dropping down. So you see that at all times, right? Gravity is 10. Your ball is actually pulling downwards, okay? So this is a situation where the ball is thrown into the air. Okay, I'm pretty sure if you refer to your tenure series, there's a couple of questions like that too, okay? And now I'll move on to question two. Okay, question two, we have a ball with an unknown mass down a frictionless slope. Principle of conservation of energy, you just need to know, okay? If you don't know this, you lose a mark in the exam. Okay, there are two principles. Principle of conservation of energy, principle of moments. You need to know both of them, okay? State conversion, this is pretty obvious. Now calculate the speed of the ball. Some students get stuck here because they think half mv square mgh. Then they, hey, jalat, I don't have mass, right? How? Mass is unknown. But the truth is that if you take a look closely at the equation, you notice that there's mass on both sides. So you can actually take away the mass, right? And then you just need to manipulate the remaining figures to find out the velocity. So as long as you have the vertical height, right? You are able to find the change to velocity. You actually don't need the mass, okay? Um, now, if the ball is traveling along the frictionless surface before it enters the sand pit with friction 6 Newton and it travels 5.5, I want you to know here that the energy of your ball is being worn out. Why? Because the energy here is used to do work done against friction. Okay. Um, so what has happened here, okay, is that we take force times distance. The force here is your frictional force times the distance travel. So work done against friction is 60 times 5.5. Okay. Now, um, here you notice that I use M 
GH, which is M uh, 10 and 10, right? But why do I use MGH instead of half MV square? Can I use half MV square? I can. It's just that 14.4 square is a little bit more tricky. Okay, why is this correct, right? It's because all of the GPE turn into KE. And the KE is used to overcome the friction, right? So technically, I can just use my GPE to solve, right? Then I solve for M. The ball is actually freaking heavy as 3.3 kg. Okay, so assuming, because we know that GP and K is the same. So I can use either of them to solve. If you want to use half MV square, you can do so. It will just be half unknown M. V square will be 14.1 square. You will still get the same answer. Okay. Uh, lastly, examples where friction is useful. Huh? Just go study. Huh? Okay. Uh, question three here. Uh, this is about a computer processor. So those of you that do gaming a lot, right? You'll know that when your processor is too hot, okay? is bad for your computer, sometimes overheat. So a lot of times what they design in your PC is that they have a cooling system. So you know those very secret, like, like aftershock, then they have all the wire running through of, it's sometimes even, even water flowing through, right? The reason why there's such a thing is that they want to help the processor cool down by conducting heat away, okay? So for your this one, what's happening is that the computer fins, okay, are actually present such that it allows for conduction to occur. Not only conduction, convection, and radiation as well. So you pay attention, right? Why conduction? Conduction is because it's made of metal, good conductor of heat. Convection is because you see the gaps in between, right? So it allows for the movement of air, which allows the setup of convection current, okay? Lastly, it's black in color because black emits heat the best. So there's a specific reason why it's designed like that, okay? Uh, differences, this one you can just go and study. Uh, drawing the convection current as well, okay? Hot water, hot, water, hot air rise, co air sinks, okay? And then if you need to explain, once again, we talked about the keyword, so expands, less dense, rises, okay? Then cooler, denser air sinks, all right? So this is the answer for question three. Question four, waves, okay? So amplitude is from here to here, there's five, Wavelength is from one point to the other, right? So 10. Period, okay? So how many waves were completed? One, two, three. Not three, but 2.5. Ah, don't get tricked, ah. So once again, one, this is one, 2.5. Okay, so I take the total time, which is 10 milliseconds divided by 2.5. I'll get four milliseconds. Frequency, I take one divided by a period. So four milliseconds, which is why my frequency is 250. Okay. Now, if we assume that the first wave, wave A wavelength is twice that of B, what is the speed of the wave? You know that when you see such questions, right? Eventually, it will come to this formula, B equals to F lambda. Okay. So we know that the frequency here is 250. Okay. Um, wavelength, it's twice the length, right? So what do you mean by twice the length? Okay, so twice the length means uh, before that, the wavelength, it's how much? 10 cm, right? So 0 0.1 meter. I divide it by two because A's wavelength is twice that of B. Okay, that's how I get 12.5. All right, give me a moment. I take out my charger for my laptop. Okay, if not, let's move on to the next question. Okay, question five, this is obviously about refraction, right? Okay, so the thing to avoid mistakes that you cannot make is if you use 60, right? I'm not going to slap you, but you really need to slap yourself awake, right? Because if this is 60, you need to tell yourself, it is not 60, it is not 60. Why? It's because it's always between the light ray and the normal. So this is 30, okay? Then A, but remember what I said, is always sine air over sine medium. So sine A over sine 30. That's how you find your uh, refractive index, which is 1.5. Therefore, the A is 48.6. Anyway, you just need to remember when you go from medium to air, right? It bends away from the normal. So the 30 must always bend away. The number will increase, cannot be decreased. Okay, so this is 48.6. Okay, now that we, we also already know what the refractive index is, we can find the critical angle. Just need to use the formula. Okay, for those of you that are wondering, so how does, what is this formula? How does it work? 
it's actually theoretically sine i over sine r. Why do I say that? Okay. Uh, remember, it's always sine air over sine medium, right? So the sine air is such that when the refracted rate is 90 degree, right? Sine medium, instead of R, I write sine C because at this specific angle in my medium, it becomes the critical angle. Sine 90 is one. So N equals to one over sine C. So that is how you derive this formula. Okay, it's because sine 90 is equals to one. Okay, so critical angle is 41.8. What does the critical angle do? Is like the minimum angle that you need. If you go past this, you can undergo total eternal reflection. If you're below 41.8, you cannot. It's as if you go to a theme park, you take a ride, right? You need to be at least 140 to take the roller coaster, right? If you're not above that height, you cannot undergo this ride, known as total internal reflection. Only if you exceed it, then you can. Okay, so here clearly we see that C, if this is 70 total internal reflection, this is also 70 degrees. So this one can undergo total internal reflection. Okay, two conditions, this one you need to know. Huh? Optically denser, optically less dense, angle of incidence greater than critical angle. Okay, so diamond higher refractive index, how would value of B change? Value of B will be lower. Just need to put it back in, into N equals to sine air over sine medium. Then you'll be fine. Question six, toaster. Yes, I'm hungry now. Okay, toaster. Safety features. Okay, um, what should we have? It's called earth wire, right? Because there's a bit of a metal casing here. So in case uh, it touches the metal casing, it provides a path for the charges to be discharged, right? So it's very important. Uh, same thing, I need an insulating case, right? So to prevent the part of the wire and metal parts from being in di direct contact with users. Okay, all of these are under practical electricity. Okay, current P equals to VI. This one don't have to explain. Fuse rating must always be higher than your current. Okay, uh, some students ask me, Joe, why not four? Why you write five? Okay, it's because when we are discussing fuse rating, there are few standard ones. Okay, it'll be good if you know this. Uh, even if you don't know this, I think it's still okay. But standard fuse rating usually go by 3, 5, 10, 13, which is why I chose 5. Lah. Okay. If you choose 4, I think still explain it, still can. Lah. I mean, technically not wrong, as long as it's above the current. Okay. Um, D, how do we calculate uh, maximum resistance if I want to cap my power loss to 40? This one, you just need to use power equals to I square R. If you're wondering what is this power equals to I square R, uh, this is the same thing as P equals to VI, but I just sub in V equals to IR into, it's like math, right? Substitution. So if V equals to RI, I sub in V, V because the RI times I, so I square R, something like that. So that is how I'll do my calculation to deduce that um, the maximum resistance I can be is 2.84. Okay. Lastly, use for 5 minutes for 30 days, 15 cents. Okay, convert the 5 minutes to hours. Okay, or you can just take 5 times 30. Like how many minutes is that? 150 minutes, right? And how many hours is that? It's around 2.5 hours. Then you go and calculate. Unit of electricity is kilowatt per hour. So you can go and calculate accordingly. You can take a look at the working. You should be able to find the cost. Okay, section D. Here we see... Um, extract okay from an online article this is about northern lights okay, i'm not too sure whether any of you have seen it before but i think in your lifetime you should go and catch it okay it's very nice okay but how does it work is really about electromagnetic waves transferring energy causing a spectrum of colors so what you need to know here is you need to state two properties of em waves okay and there are a couple of properties okay but there are two specific ones that you can find from the passage okay which is transfer of energy okay and the fact that it can travel through a vacuum I know for EM waves, right, we tend to just study the, the R, um, the, you know, the, 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 the sequence, sorry, the radio, then your microwave, then your infrared. So we tend to study that page, but we kind of forget about that. There's also properties of EM waves that we need to study. Sorry, I'll show you. Huh? So normally we study this page, right? Radio, microwave, all the way to gamma. Okay, then we kind of know the sequence and their users. But don't forget that you also need to know the properties which are listed here, okay? So if you take a look, these are two properties, okay? And they can be substantiated uh, by information from the passage, okay? Possible explanation why we see a variety of colors, okay? Is because when the electrons collide, okay? The energy transfer vary, okay? 
Okay, so when it varies, you get different frequency and wavelengths of visible light. Therefore, you get different colors. Okay, then two other EM waves higher frequency than visible light, anything from UV to X-ray to gamma, and then you just need to mention their users. Okay, so we also can see this phenomenon whereby the white light will spread into a spectrum of colors. Okay, how is it achieved? Okay, it's achieved largely by light undergoing refraction. Okay, so whether red light or violet light has a greater wavelength, okay, you can take a look at the explanation here, but largely we need to recall that light is also a wave, so it follows V equals to F lambda. Okay, so when a color of a smaller wavelength enters the prism, okay, smaller wavelength means lesser speed. Lesser speed means my angle of refraction will increase because here my refractive index is fixed. If my speed of light in medium decreases, okay, uh, my angle of refraction will increase as well. So in conclusion, shorter wavelength lights that is in the violet and blue region experience more bending than the longer wavelengths, which is why we justify red as a longer wavelength. If you're kind of confused here, it's okay. I really don't think it will appear, but I've seen this in a couple of brilliant papers, which is why I included it. Okay, Go and read through this a few times, see if it makes sense. If it doesn't, I think don't have to be too stressed out. Okay, this is... Uh, I think this one, uh, the one on this page is more important. This one. Eh, where is it? The, eh? The, 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 the. Sorry, did I just... Uh, this one is more important. Okay, this page must know. Okay, the light spectrum one, good to know. All right. Now, question eight, once again, this is about DC circuits. Okay, this is the last question. So let's do this. Okay, let's get this down and grounded. Okay, defining current shouldn't be a problem. Huh? Okay, um, M meter registers 0.5. Determine I1, I2. In order to solve this, we need to go back to recognize that the voltage across parallel arm would be the same, which means the voltage that is going through the first lane, second lane, and third lane is constant. So here in the third lane, I know that my current is 0 0.5 ampere. My resistance is 6 ohm. So if I take V equals to Ri, 6 times 0 0.5, I know my voltage is 3 volt which means this lane gets 3 volt, first lane gets 3 volt, this lane also gets 3 volt. With voltage and resistance, I can then find their currents. Okay? So this is from memorizing, not memorizing, but knowing that each branch across each parallel circuit has a constant voltage. Okay. Next, how do I find total current? I just need to work backwards. I add my I1, I2, as well as my 0 0.5, the three current here, we can recombine it back, okay, to find out what's the total current. Okay, in this case, it's 2.75, okay? What would the reading on this voltmeter be? Okay, take note. Do you notice here that there's this wire Z, right? So what this means is that when the current reaches here, right, it's asking myself, do I want to go through the 3 ohm or do I want to take the wire Z route? They will always take the wire Z route. Why? It's because wire Z has no resistance. It's so much easier. Obviously, I take the path of least resistance. So I bypass it. This is called a short circuit, which means the electricity doesn't pass through this tree. If this tree ohm is a light bulb, it will not light up. Okay, so from here, as the current passes through, the first thing we see is we hit this parallel circuit. Okay, now, if we know that the total EMF is six, and I know that my parallel circuit here receives 3 volt. What this means is that at this parallel branch is also receiving 3 volts. So 3 volts here, 3 volts here, total 6 volt. Okay, therefore answer is 3 volt. Okay, Jeannie asks, uh, do we memorize formulas so that we can rearrange them for electricity? There are a couple of formulas that you roughly need to know, okay, which are what? Current uh, equals to charge over time, okay? The famous one, V equals to IR, Okay, uh, underrated one is voltage equals to energy over charge. There's also power equals to voltage times current. Okay, um, I know here I say memorize, but um, normally for my students or during the crash course, I'll explain this, uh, but today we don't really have that much time, right? We're left with 10 minutes, okay? So largely, I'm just highlighting the key formulas that you need to remember, okay? But I think it's always better for you to understand that, okay? So you go and revise a bit more, I think that will help, all right? Okay, for part E, determine the resistance of X. So how do we find out the resistance of X? Here, okay, 
we need to kind of work backwards. Okay, so you look at the working, this is not the most common one, but I want you to recognize what is going on. Why did I take 3 divided by 2.75? 3 here is because V equals to Ri, R equals to V over I. The voltage I have solved in part D is 3. Current, okay, why did I say 2.75? Okay, it's because the total current of the circuit is 2.75, right? So that would help me find the total resistance. Total resistance of what? Total resistance of the 4 ohm plus the X. Okay, then from there, all I need to do is to work backwards. Okay, now that I know my resistance, okay, it's 12 over 11. My effective resistance is 12 over 11. I can take 1 over my effective resistance equals to 1 over 4 plus 1 over x. Then I solve for x, which is 1.5. So I repeat again, how do we find the resistance? I take total voltage of my parallel branch here over total current to find total effective resistance. Then I work backwards because I got 1 over x and 1 over 4 then I do equals to 1 over effective resistance. Then I solve for x. Okay, so it's about forming an equation and making sure that uh, it fits into the correct value. Okay, and if I remove wire Z, what happens is now my current would flow through the 3 ohm resistor. Okay, that's part F. And lastly, to calculate the new reading in the ammeter, we just need to find the new current, sorry, the new resistance after we add in the 3 ohm. Okay, then because my voltage is still the same, I would be able to find my total current. And when my total current approaches this point, okay, this is the last part already, yeah, so stay with me. When I have my total current here, how does my current split? My current splits in such a way that when they split, each branch will receive such that they get the same voltage. So if you pay special attention to the values here, right, okay, so we got two, four, and six. What this means, right, is that if you go and look at my working, right, you see this 3, 1.51, 1 right? Why do I say that? It's because the current here needs to be three times that of here. Why do I say that? It's because 3 times 2 equals to 6. 1 times 6 equals to 6. 1.5 times 4 equals to 6. I need all of them to eventually have the same voltage. So the ratio in which the current splits will be in such a ratio whereby it's 3, 1.5, and 1. So when I take my total current divided by these values, the proportions, I'll get the ammeter reading. Okay. If you think that the last part here is a bit more complicated, it is because it's more complicated. Okay, I included this as a challenge. Okay. So give yourself some time to review this. Okay. But if you really don't understand it, uh, I'll be honest, it's usually not so difficult. Okay. So uh, this is more of like an add-on. Okay, but I think with that, we come to the end of the paper. I'll give you maybe two to three minutes to ask some questions with regards to paper one and paper two. Okay, for the last part, I will not explain again. Uh, if you want to hear my explanation again, you can refer to the YouTube video that I'll eventually upload when I'm free over the next couple of days. Okay, um, but I think more importantly, I think you need to be able to solve from part A to part D. E and F, E, F, G is a bit more challenging. Okay, uh, for question 6D, why cannot use V square over R, 6D, where is 6D? D, D, D. V square, P equals to V square, 6D. Where's the P? There's no power, right? So that's why you cannot use V square over R. Okay, no power. Okay, any other questions? If RF equals to zero, can it be both stationary and constantly moving? Yes, if resultant force is zero, there are two possibilities. One is that it's just not moving, right? There's no, all forces acting on it are cancelled out, the object stays stationary. Another possibility is the objects are already moving, but resultant force is zero, so it's moving at constant speed and does not undergo acceleration. Okay, uh, 6D. Okay, so if you take a look at 6D, right, we are saying that because we know that when current passes through a wire, there will be some power loss in the form of heat, right? But 
But what we want to do is we want to ensure that the power loss does not exceed 40 watts. Okay, so if you take a look at it, okay, if we need to cap it to 40 watts, we use the formula I square R, we know what is our power, which is 40. We also know that our current is 3.75. Right, I square, so I square it. So how do I find R? If P equals to I square R, R equals to P divided by I square. That's why my uh, resistance maximum is 2.84. Okay, uh, can you use V square over R? You could as well. Uh, but then you need to go and use voltage instead of current. Okay, if the question states constant speed, do we always conclude the acceleration zero? Yes, something that is moving at constant speed is not accelerating. So acceleration will always be zero. Okay, we have one more question here from Julia. MCQ question eight. Eight, eight, eight. Eight. Two point, you mean 18? A question eight? Yeah, option A. Two, one, three. Oh, is it my value is wrong, is it? It's supposed to be 21.3, is it? Um, I'm not too sure. Maybe we can, I can do a quick calculation now. Maybe I typed into the calculator wrongly. Give me a moment. Uh, I'll just double check right now. Okay. So for the working, for those that are, of you that are wondering, we should take 60 plus 25, which is 85 times 10. That will give me my weight of 850 Newton. Okay. After that, what do we need to do? We need to multiply it by the distance traveled, which is 30 meters. So my total work done should be 25500. Uh, you can put it as juice. Lah. Okay. So this is my work done. Okay, then divided in two minutes. Okay, so it should be 120 seconds. So divide by 120. Okay, so answer should be 213. Or 212.5, you round up to 3SF, so 213. So I think this one is correct. Okay. Could you explain more about the safety device, about how it protects the user and prevent excess current? Um, I think honestly, this one is already in the notes. Uh, you can refer to either the free notes or if you have the curated notes, you can do so. Uh, but I'll just briefly run through since that's a request. Okay, so we have a couple of safety features from Chiprin Plug, which allows a path for chargers to travel from metal casing to the ground. Uh, we also have double insulation. The switch, okay, switch not really, lah, but fuse, I think, yes, because when current is above the fuse rating, it melts and breaks the circuit. So it protects your component. And obviously, there's a circuit breaker. But this one, not so much because electromagnetism is removed, right? So you will not need this as much, okay? But these are the few parts, okay? Whereby uh, it helps, okay? A uh, brief explanation of earth wire, okay? So for earth wire, you just need to know that what earth wire does is that where if a person touches it without an earth wire, electricity or the voltage will flow through the person. You cannot electric shock. But if you have earth wire, you notice here, the current is being redirected to the ground. So the person will not get electrocuted. So for objects with a metal casing, you need an earth wire. Okay, so if not, I think I'll end off here for the questions. Okay, uh, let me just conclude this session by sharing a little bit more about uh, what's to come your way. Okay. So what's to come your way? Um, we know that O level is how many more weeks? It is six, seven weeks thereabout, right? So you think about it, right? Six, seven weeks. I want you to think about it in terms of weekends. You have six to seven weekends left. Is there a lot of time? No. <laughs> it's actually quite late already, right? There's not much time. But I think even within this limited period of time, as you start to really ramp up on your revision post prelims, I want you to know that no matter what you do, you should always aim to get your content right. Okay, so this is really the first step because if you don't get your content right, when you attempt practices, you won't be able to solve them or you're not too sure how to approach those. So the best way to think about this is always you get your content right, you test the rigor of your understanding by trying out questions. So we know we study kinematics, for example, but there are different ways questions could be set to test you about kinematics. So the practice comes in only after you understand your content. 
Okay, so never ever just do practice blindlessly if you don't even know your content. So set your foundation. Okay, uh, lastly, once you're done practicing and you want to check whether you really know your stuff, a good way to do so is to test yourself. Ask yourself, okay, uh, for example, how do I explain convection current? Then you think about the keywords that you need. Okay, even better still, you have a study buddy or study click, right? One group of you, test each other. So you ask each other questions, okay? And then you'll look at a certain question together. You can break it down to see if you all know how to solve it, okay? That would be most helpful because after testing yourself, and if you're able to the extent, explain it to somebody else, you know that you truly know your stuff. And that's when you can say you're really ready for your O-levels, okay? So I know six to seven weeks, not a lot of time, but if you are determined and you have a plan and you're disciplined, you can still do a lot, okay? And a lot means you can really make major improvements and work towards your dream score. All right. Um, just to share a bit more on what's going on, uh, for those of you who are new to Overmark, okay, uh, we actually do a lot of crash courses. If you are you're still not aware, right? Okay, uh, we actually have these sessions every Saturdays. Uh, it's a four-hour session to condense uh, whatever we are hoping to teach you into this very focused session, whereby we'll go through key concepts and we'll also pick out selected questions from your TRS, teach you how to solve them and what to look out for. So a little bit like what we do today, but covering more a lot more on content recap and also spotting more commonly tested questions that you'll see at O-Level. Okay, If you come for the session, you also get a copy of the curated notes. So the one that I was referring to earlier, that's the curated notes. Okay, If you don't want to come for the crash course and you only want to buy the curated notes, you can do so as well. But only if you need it, assuming your school notes, you find that it's not that good, you want something else to refer to, you could consider this. Okay. So um, if you're taking chem bio, you won't be here already. So if you're taking chem physics, okay, I have one last session on the 25th, okay? That will be from 2 to 6 p.m. Uh, it'll be a four-hour session in person. So if you come, you'll attend, uh, you get the curated notes. And on top of that, you also, uh, I'll run through the content with you. Like every single chapter, what to look up for, what are the kind of questions, so on and so forth, okay? I think right now there's around 10 slots left there, there about. So if you want to sign up, you can consider it. Um, if you sign up with a friend, just write both your names in the promo code section, you actually enjoy 10% off. Okay. But I think more importantly, uh, moving forward from this point, I really hope that uh, anybody here that are still with me now, okay, and attended this session, you find it useful. And I think more importantly, that the mock paper gave you a good uh, breakdown on the kind of questions okay, that you might still be struggling with and therefore spend more time revising it. Okay. But at the end of the day, I think wishing everybody all the best for your O levels. Okay, do it well. And you know, with the remaining time you have, make full use of it. Okay, then leave no regrets. Okay. Uh, if not, I come to the end of today's session. Um, you can still continue to ask me some questions. I'll be around for the next five minutes. Okay. Thank you, everyone.